All right, it is time for Prune Market Prep at the close. Three consecutive highs open, matched yesterday's low, and then once it took out there, that's all the breakout momentum traders needed. Joel, come all the way back. All the way back. In there. Nothing, nothing can stop this market. We're all the way back. We're all the way up. Bear. All the way up. Where are those bears from this morning? They're probably back in their caves, folks. Uh, we took out the uh, overnight low and, and then some went all the way to 43 and a quarter. Uh, boom, boom. Interday low, some lows from uh, March 10th low was uh, 47 even. Tested that a couple times, and then we just turned around, and we are green on the session. Uh, back at 3,900, who would have thunk that this morning when we traded 38.43 and a quarter? Your current high, 01, a couple closes uh, from Friday and Tuesday at 3,900. But once again, if we get up to that old 3,900 to 3,920 area, not much in there as we witnessed from yesterday's session. Uh, not a good day for crude. Crude is in the red by $2.86. Wow, look at those last three days of almost matching ranges, but now bearing down on the low of the move. Uh, gold's not participating in the rally. That's down 720 at 1726 even. Silver in the red by 7.6 cents at 25.155. And Bitcoin. We're for uh, 1500 off the low, made a low at uh, 55.95. We're only down 2400 here at 52,195. Uh, I'm not ready to throw out this morning's show just yet. I, I, I am still in the camp of this is a sell of the rent market until proven. Okay, uh, one good day does not change my mind. Uh, that being said, you look around the market and you see a whole lot of uh, a foreign color. I'm not used to seeing some kind of a some kind of a greenish tint. I think. Uh, yeah. Green. Yep. You look at pretty much most sectors. Most indexes are in the green. Most sectors, except for energy, and I think communication. Um, energy might be flat, but everything else is pretty much in the green. Um, and yeah, it's just one of those days where where the market is up, but I, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced. I'm still in the camp of this is a sell the rent market until proven otherwise. All right. Well, this I, is a rip to sell, man. Yeah. 60 handles off the low. I don't know who much uh, – um, uh, someone in the chat from this morning, I can't remember who it was, but they were said, hey, we're going to go red and turn around and uh, end up green on the session. So – by the dippers reign supreme. Let's see if we can identify some of the strength and uh, identify uh, whether we're going to have some continuation moves. Uh, I don't think we have anything big on the docket for tomorrow, correct? Not, not, not to my knowledge. No. Uh, so we, we have a doc where we sort of keep track of what we're going to talk about for the show. We don't always follow the doc. But, yes. And, and this is proof because on today's doc, I did write down the fact that GameStop, AMC, and KOSS were all up in the after-hour session. They spent their pre-market session leaking, but they were all up overnight, and we didn't get to it. And I wish I wish I had mentioned it. I really yeah. did. In hindsight, because GameStop, for whatever reason, don't ask me why, is up 50%. AMC is up 25%, and KOSS is up also 50%. So if anyone has an explanation, I'm all ears, but I noted that overnight. Wish I mentioned it this morning. Yeah. Well, whew, look at that uh, for the GameStop. If you were a technical trader, look at that. Oh, wow. Two lows. Well, not exactly in the same area. Uh, the old undercut and rally. Uh, you uh, had a low yesterday of 1862. You went to 1690. But boy, when you came back up through that low, whew, Low risk trade, 186.39. Now that's above the close from yes, uh, from uh, well, yesterday and two days ago. What's the high? Ah, we'll see. 201.75 was your is your high from Tuesday. I don't know. Just uh, just a rebound. It 
just maybe people were looking for the follow through on the downside in uh, uh, double digits and that didn't happen. So bouncing right back, basically in the same area as where it closed uh, before the earnings report. Interesting. 81, 181.75. That was your close on March 23rd and uh, currently trading right at 181. So the street, uh, the verdict still out on GameStop earnings. And then uh, you mentioned AMC. Yep. AMC. Oh, oh, man, these stocks do trade well together. This one, uh, what are the matching lows from yesterday? 893, 895 and turned it around and now back up. Right near the high of the session, uh, eleven thirty-two is your current high. Eleven twenty-one yesterday. Let's see if Cost did the same thing. C K O S S. Uh, let's see. Uh, the lows were uh forty cents apart there. So, if you're trading off daily levels, daily highs and lows, you could have got some uh, some good trades off there. Uh, for everyone in chat, uh, coming up next at 4.15 after we're done with that to close is Mike uh, Crawford. We've got the CEO of Hall of Fame Resort coming up. Uh, so that'll be – that's HOFE. That'll be at 4.15 today. In the meantime, let's just run through what else we saw in the market that was interesting. Uh, one stock that is not playing ball today is Netflix. A lot of tech is up. Most tech is up. Netflix is not. Netflix caught it. I think they caught a downgrade this morning. I was think, that it? We actually had an analyst movie, a stock? I think it was Benchmark, but it's been a few hours since I looked. Okay. I vaguely remember seeing that. but mm. I, I So they got, oh, uh, boy, you could, you could say this is an important area. Kind of like the Roku. Uh, who was talking about the Roku this morning? I think that rebounded, right? Uh, this well, yeah, I, I would I would assume it did. If, if, if that's yeah, a little bit off. Uh, yeah, it went yeah. with the market. Uh, but uh, Netflix, all I can say is for you, we don't talk about Netflix much anymore. No, we don't. But oh, boy, I mean, you got it not on the lows here. This is got an area, right? And you got four lows right around here. Let's call it uh, 493 to 499, 496, 497. So that's important to gap up from the earnings. <laughs> New all time high on earnings day. Gave it all back. I don't know. Monthly lows here. Keeping an eye on this uh, 495 to 500 must hold for Netflix. Uh, Joel, we had an IPO open below the IPO price today. Did you see that? No, which one? Vizio, V Z I O. IPO price twenty one dollars a share. Shares opened at seventeen fifty. You don't see that very often. No, no, and uh, hmm, boy, a big seller there at nineteen. I mean, this is all I can glean from the the daily charts there, but. Someone wants out at 19. That's a rare. Now, so this is Vizio. What's the uh the stock that um the Kath dabbles in? Does it also start with a V? Yeah, oh it's Vuzzy. Vuzzy. Oh, oh, oh Vuzzy? Vuzzy? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, not to get confused, but uh, uh no, it's just I, first of all, it's rare. Also it opened a little bit late. I thought it didn't. It didn't open until almost one o'clock, which was on the late side. I remember. Uh, I think Uber opened below the IPO price, and I remember Blue Apron opened be be below the IPO price. APRN, but you don't see that very often. It, it, no, not a good sign. What? What? Uh, what's this company do? This is Vizio. This is the, the TV maker. The TV. Maker. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. TV. I've seen yeah. those TVs. Okay. And, yeah, and it's just you know, it, all it means is you know, hey, for once the. Uh, the people buying the stock aren't getting the worst the worst deal. <laughs> no, that's interesting. But uh yeah, 19. I mean, you can see it on the 15, you can see right. it on the 30. I mean, yeah. monthly, daily, one day's action. Another leg up here in the SPs. We are now over 3900, up 23 handles at uh 390375. So Big old turnaround here in the S&P's. Turnaround Thursday doesn't sound as good as turnaround no. Tuesday. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Uh, Art Styles is noting that Square is also not participating today. And it, so it's down a little over 2%. 
That's been trading with crypto a little bit lately. It's mm-hmm. off the low. You just just cling to two hundred there, Art. I mean, look at that. All those monthly lows here, including this month's low. Uh, boom, this month's low. It's actually a little bit lower. 191, 195, 197. So there's your monthly support. So just, uh, you know, backing and filling here, hoping that uh, that low. I mean, I think you even got to give it a little bit more than 400. I see so far the monthly low is uh, at 191.36. So uh, you're actually going to get a green candle out of this if it can uh, close above 208.11. So uh, not a great day, but. Uh, you know, down 436, but still above support. They're actually matching this exact low here at uh, 201, 20210. That's what you're looking at. Square and maybe Bitcoin. Maybe, you know, that's been trading with Bitcoin a little bit. Maybe that that's weighing it down today. Are you correct? Want Joel's thoughts on Intel to the extent that I, I, I really, uh, really boy, that was- bad. I feel bad making Joel look at this chart. We know he doesn't want to look at it. We know he doesn't like. That's okay. He doesn't like bugging stocks that he owns. But ah, okay. I mean, that was they sold the living daylights out of that thing yesterday, right? Off the good news, and maybe some of that was market related. Uh, but still, like the well, you got down to sixty ninety six today. It looks like a. You breached a little bit into the trading range, lower end of that trading range that you've been holding since, like, uh, you know, beginning of March. So, boy, oh boy, I like to work my way back through that red bar there. Got a lot of people caught on that one, but uh, sticking with it short term or sticking with it long term, short term, let's see here. You're probably going to have two closes in the same area. Uh, yesterday's close 62.04. We're at 62.29. So, uh, recovered not as much as I'd like to, considering how the market's ripped. Toddy Paranati, I don't recall seeing you before in the chat. Welcome, Toddy. Uh, is asking about X. U.S. Steel, while well, you think with like eighty-seven trillion dollars going into infrastructure, uh, sure. that's sure. yeah, yeah, it should be good for the stock. Uh, let's see. Let's break this. What you want to see here is you want to, you got a string of one, two, three, four, five lower highs. Looks like that street's going to be broken tomorrow. 2067 is a current high. 2042 is where you're currently trading. So, you know, it looks like it's going to break that string of lower highs. And, uh, I think things open up into the, 21 handle. Uh, your two day high is up at 2118. So looks like uh, looks like you're gonna break that string of lower highs in X. I thought it'd be up, you know, when they start talking about that much money for infrastructure. I thought it'd be a little bit higher, but uh not a bad day. Did have that big run up over 24, just digesting a little bit of the up move, uh pulling back. Um, I just had a uh I'm just blanking on what I wanted to uh, bring up just now. Oh yeah, uh, talk about broken trend, Joel. The the tel- uh, not telecom. The traditional broadcasting names, Viacom and Discovery. Trend is broke. Oh, I know. Broken. Broken. I know. I know. Oh boy, that offering. Satic downgraded to sell today. Holy moly! Uh, Sixty bucks. Let's see. The next day, you have some daily lows there. Uh, boom, boom. What's today's low? Today's low is 64.52. What's this low right here? Ooh, you got another low at 64.60. So, boy, that's a big sell off. I mean, you hit you hit uh, 100 on Monday. Now, when you're in the 60 handle, you think this thing is going to be due for some kind of bounce, but. Uh, Boy, oh boy, what a rough three days for Viacom after doing that offering. And I saw Discovery is getting hit too. Uh, D-I-S-C-A. Um, I don't know. Did that have any news on it today or is it just following it lower? Well, they're pretty mm-hmm. together. They're pretty correlated. Yeah. How come Fox A is doing that? Fox is doing so good. Are they, I, uh... I knew you were going to ask me that and I'm not prepared for a good answer. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> All right. 
<laughs> little so, bouncing around back yeah. up at the highs of the session. Current high, 06 and a quarter. Yeah. All right. So I guess they're still going on the, the big tech thing with Facebook, Twitter, and Google to the extent that those things trade off of that. I don't I don't know how much, uh, especially today. I guess Facebook being down on a day where the market is up would would tell you one thing, but I, I don't really know. I think it had a big rally. I mean, it got up really close to 300 yep. uh, on Monday. So that's a big move of it. And it was kind of going, uh, you know, opposite the way some of the other big tech was going. So uh, four or three lower highs in a row. Uh, this is an important low. Actually, I, I give the support down to 275. Uh, two lows, uh, 74.80 and 75.41. Okay. And I wanted to, there's one more thing before I can go to the chat that I wanted to bring up. But uh, Oh, yeah, the uh, Chinese stocks, which was also on our list to discuss this morning, and we didn't really get to it. But, uh, and my fault for not mentioning it, I, I wish I mentioned it this morning. I guess that that law, that, that delisting law was adopted by the SEC today is, is why there's pressure on uh, pretty much every single U.S. listed Chinese company today, uh, Alibaba, Baidu, JD, all, really all of them, uh, basically just a, a, a stricter law on who can have their, their, their company shares listed in the United States. It was adopted by the SEC today. Hmm. Well, that's definitely scaring shareholders here a little bit in the FXI. Uh, still good. Still haven't got down to uh, your couple monthly lows, forty four sixty six and forty four sixty five. So uh, down, but not out. Let's take a look at it. Bob are getting hit on this news. Yeah, they all are. So basically, well, all the law says is, hey, if you don't, uh, if you don't keep up, wow, right back down. If you don't keep up with your financial disclosures. Uh, and auditing um, your audits for I think it's I think it's three years or a couple years. If you don't keep on top of that stuff, you're you're gone. You're you're getting delisted. That that's basically what this rule says. And look what you're coming into here. Uh, this is what I was trying to get off the mat. Although those highs two twenty five two twenty six, you've taken that out now. That's not good. So you only have three lows to deal with here. Now, uh, two other lows before you get to the low of the move. And your stopping points are 220.08. You haven't got there in the session. And then the other two lows are 1532. Then the ultimate low of the move here was 211.23. So that pop over 240, that was faded very quickly uh, back in the lower 220 handle for Alibaba. David Knowles, don't remind me, man. I own K-Web. All right, I'm getting lost today. I'm getting smacked around and dragged through the mud, but that's that's okay. That's the market. That's, that's the market for you. Let's do some tickers from the chat. Anyone have a ticker, drop them in, and we will cover. JR mentioned Grogen, which we did not cover this morning, and they had earnings which we did not get to on this morning show. Um, I thought they had earnings, or maybe they didn't have, maybe, is that tonight? That might be tonight, actually. Let me confirm in the pro. Um, ba, 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 ba. No, they did not report. Uh, yeah, these stocks didn't get the bump yesterday off the, uh, was it in the New York news? I stand corrected. They did report late last night. Wow, 7 p.m. last night. Okay. Um, they raised their guidance for 2021. I like to see this thing hold 46. I mean, you had you had the big drop. You took over half of it back, and then some turned around at 60 bucks, and now you're just hanging in here. Uh, figure that exact 50% retracement and see if you can hold in there. Looks like you're going to get a double close. You're only down 11 cents. So you're going to have two closes in the same area. So that gives you a good level going into tomorrow's session. Uh, SPs just peaked, uh, just hit 07 and a quarter. Looks like uh, we're gonna end up uh, green on the session here. By uh, well, right now we're green by 26 handles. A lot of people are asking by HOFV. I'm not gonna make Joel do technicals. We're gonna talk to the CEO in 20 minutes. So just save your questions. Wait 20 minutes, everyone. Take a chill pill. What about what about ATPS? I forget why. That's this- all high flyer, isn't it? Well, it's $75. Yeah, definitely a high flyer. Yeah. Uh, 
I forget why this came up this morning, or maybe it wasn't on the show. Maybe it was in chat. I forget where. Somebody mentioned this to me this morning. Okay. Ah, uh, boy, these are old levels. Man, this thing is crazy. Look at that. This is a volatile stock. Uh, let me get rid yeah. of these levels because they don't aren't relevant anymore. Man, you guys are giving me some tough charts today. Holy mackerel. I mean, there was nothing to lean on on the low. And there's nothing to lean on on the high as far as like I'm look what I mean by lean on is like uh, a level within a reasonable area. Uh, bad day yesterday. You want to work your way through that bar. Uh, let's see. 72 and a quarter was low. You back above that. Ah. Folks, you got me stumped on this one. There's a lot of air in this thing. If somehow we get some momentum. Your three day closes at eighty five twenty nine. So this is a, this is a tough one. I, I I will say though overall the stock has had a nice run, got over triple digits. It's working on a red month. You haven't had a red month since uh, October. So uh, maybe we're due here a little bit for a little bit more of a pullback. I just don't like the the you know the flippy floppy price action on that. All right. When I said that a lot of Chinese or U.S. listed Chinese stocks were down, I I should have said that is uh, the exceptions to that rule today are the EV stocks, right? Neo, LE, and XPEV are all up today. So uh, go figure. Then again, so is Tesla. They're all up. Uh, boom. Uh, Basically, Neo every every EV stock is up today. Really? Pretty much. Did you say LE? L I, sorry. L L. Okay. Okay. Um man. I mean, it's it fighting back from bad days yesterday and not getting it all the back. So getting some nice bounces. Uh let's see. Tesla is getting a nice bounce as, as well. Uh hanging in there right around mid range that whole uh, that whole break. Didn't a lot of people are probably waiting for six hundred uh this morning. Couldn't quite get there, so 609.50 was the low. So having to buy into an up tape, which is a lot harder than when it's coming down and they're just smashing your bids. We're we're at the high of the session, Joel. Yeah, this is uh, here. So I, I guess I guess here's what we'll say, right? Or here's what I'll say is if you were like freaking out this morning, then use then then, then this is a gift. This is a gift, right? If, if you were like nervously sitting at your desk, you were shaking in fear. Over your positions, then this today's rally is a gift for you. Take it. Well, I mean, it's what one thing that I know we did have some bearish talk this morning, but we just talked about the resilience of the S and P. That's true. And yeah, true. in that you know, just under all different circumstances, it just seems like someone you know, it's never like the like in in March of last year, you had to all out just sell everything. That mentality is not there in this market. When they're selling, they're buying something else. And the rotation within those 500 stocks is keep, I mean, all time closing high, I believe, well, 39.64.50. So we still got some work to do, but you can't deny a very good day. Uh, now over 60 points, 70 points off that early morning low of 43 and a quarter. Yeah. It's a great point. There's definitely been a divergence where the S and P has held up, and you can see it's up more today than the Nasdaq. Uh, although the Russell is is, I guess, the high flyer. So how disappointed do you have to be in Apple today, right? Up, I mean, it's up a little bit more percentage of the market, but I mean, this thing is just stuck in the mud. You hit that support. Well, what about, forget just, Apple. What about Amazon? It's down today. AMZM. Yeah, it's in the red. That sucks. Just those stocks, man. They just haven't. They just, once again, since the earnings, these stocks have just been out of favor. And who knows? Maybe into the next earnings report. Definite rotation. Uh, S&P's caught a little bit of a cold here. We got to 39.09.50. Uh, now back at 39, just above 3,900. Uh, Tuesdays and Fridays close was uh, right there at 3,900, just a tick below. Uh, be interesting if we get three out of five closes right in that same area. So battleground, 3,900 S&P futures. 
All right, let's look at Tiger or T I G R. I'm sorry, that, that that's that's the ticker. The the actual company is uh, Up FinTech, right? Yeah, Up FinTech. The the Chinese brokers play. Uh, I be, I know Jason Rasnick was long. I don't know if he still is, and I guess they report earnings tomorrow. Ah, uh, boy, you've already uh, you've already taken out. Whew. I don't know. I'd keep a cloak. What fifteen? What did it hit today? Hit fourteen sixteen. Boom! That low fourteen ten fourteen twenty six. You're getting a nice bounce off that. So if you do go into reverse uh, off the earnings and stuff, just be aware of a lot of support there at fourteen. And then if we decide to mount a rally here, boom boom! You've had one two three four five six lower highs in a row. Uh, so if they take this thing up. I mean, there's really nothing until just under 25. That's pretty far away. Let me see if I could uh, find something else. Oh, uh, two highs right at um, 21. So, ooh, that's still a few bucks away. For, uh, what, 16? Yeah, still a few bucks away. Uh, if you want to go even shorter term, two-day high, yesterday's high, 18.29, and then your high on Tuesday, 19.30. So, uh couple of areas of potential resistance here. They got almost a 40 bucks and then big round of profit taking. Just so the uh, chat knows, spamming your ticker in there will not make me want to we'll bring up your stock, okay? <laughs> if you're going to post it a thousand times, I'm not going to bring it up. Just a spike. Put a big old, put a big old Benjamin Franklin in there or something. And uh, you know, take a look at it. we did get some nice tips this morning. Now, all right, Spencer. I did not see the imbalances with 357 <laughs> heading into the closing bell here. Go to the buy and, side. To the buy side. A little bit to the buy side mm -hmm. on this. I don't know what to call it. Turnaround Tuesday, Thursday, thumping Thursday. I don't know, but uh, boy, if you got two uh -huh. bears this morning. Boy, oh boy, you got your head handed to you. But how many times have we seen that in this market? It, it, yeah, it makes you confused. That's all it does. It makes you confused. We, we just spent the last year living in a buy the dip every time market uh, that sort of came off in the last, what, eight weeks, uh, a little more. Yeah, earnings. Sort, sort, yep. sort of, yeah. Um, and so now, I don't know. I don't know. I like I said, I'm not convinced. I'm not full blown bullish or anything. Um, but it, this today does kind of fly in the face of of the sell the rip. Uh, I, 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 also, I, also, also, don't forget it is the end of the quarter, right? The last day of the quarter is when Wednesday, next Wednesday. So that could mess with some things. It may not, but it could mess with some things. I. I mean, I think I'm just looking at you know, the other price action in today's session, and I'm just thinking about tomorrow's session. Yeah. And we had a high, you know, usually you trend on Friday, you know, towards the highs and lows for the week. Uh, that low right now, old thing, you know, unless something happens overnight, all things considered, we're way off that low of 43 and a quarter. And then that high we had earlier in the week was 38.50. So was it 38.50 or do we? Uh, I think we're even higher on Monday. Let me go to uh, uh, my S and my S and P chart here. Days are. Let's see. Yeah, we were even higher on Monday. We were up at uh, thirty. Got up to thirty nine forty four fifty. So we're sixty points off the low and forty points off the high. So I don't know. If you get some good weather, maybe it's day to take the day off and go golfing because it's a lot of chop in this area. All right, Nick Smith did throw us a fiver to ask about All right. BBIG Vinco Ventures. Let me look up what the hell this company does um, and why we care about them right now. Oh, there's a closing bell. Look at that. I lost track of time. Uh, I, f I find out why why it popped in January and hope that they get that news again. Uh, Vinco. Um, it was. Uh, I guess there was a potential merger. I don't know if that happened. Yeah. Great support at three, and you distanced yourself from that level. So that's nice. Bounced off three on Tuesday. So I hope you got a uh, 280, 280, 290. I see a bunch of lows here just under three from 290 to 
to uh, 291, and that's including today's low. So you got your good support there. Uh, closing near the high of the session. I don't know. Maybe you're going to get a little trading range here from three to five. But uh, first things first, tomorrow, you want to see if you can get a look at 429, the current high, 382. All right. That's a wrap for the At The Close show. Joel, uh, I will see you tomorrow morning. And right and early. I hope we'll be a little bit less confused, but I can't say. I can't promise that fact. All right. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. See you, Joel. Okay. We've got. As the banner says up on the screen, Mike Crawford, the CEO, uh, president, and chairman of Hall of Fame Entertainment coming on uh, at 4.15, so in about 14 minutes from now. I'm going to bring on in uh, a second here Chris Cacci, the man who will be doing the interview from SPAC's Attack. If you don't watch SPAC's Attack, daily at 11 a.m. Eastern Time right here on Benzinga's YouTube. I highly recommend that show. Uh, this this company, uh, HOFV, or the stock, of course, was a SPAC and is not now. So allow me to pull up that chart. Now I'll pull up the chart because now I think it's a little bit more relevant. Um, and I know Chris has some good stuff planned for the conversation in a few minutes with Mike. So, look, I, I know what you guys want, right? This is a high flyer. NFT play, potentially, I guess. We're going to find out what exactly they're doing and, to be frank, how real is this, right? How real is this? How real is is NFTs um, and how real is NFTs as it relates to their business? I think a lot of people are speculating that this is the next big thing, but we don't really know, right? We don't really know. So we're going to find out, hopefully at 4.15 from Mike Crawford, who is the CEO, as I mentioned, at Hall of Fame Resort and Entertainment, H-O-F-V. Um, we've talked to other companies. We had YVR on the Power Hour. I want to say it was last, was it Friday or Thursday? I don't even remember anymore. I think it was Friday. Um, and there's a lot of divergent opinions on the NFT thing. One in chat, if you think NFTs are legit, here to stay and that companies like hall of fame entertainment are just like the first ones in the door uh two if you think nfts are just beanie babies but for the blockchain if you think nfts are are, are, are nothing but a fad throw a two in chat i have a thing it'll be split maybe maybe more ones and twos but but uh yeah so maybe maybe a little more ones and twos but not that much not that much more um, so anyway, so if you don't know about this company that I mentioned, it was a SPAC. This is the same company that, uh, oversees the hall of fame village in Canton, Ohio for the NFL hall of fame. And they have a partnership that we'll get into obviously with, with Mike, a partnership with the NFL hall of fame, not with the NFL, but with the NFL hall of fame, key difference there, uh, to basically make NFTs, uh, in some way, shape or form, through like they like license the players in the Hall of Fame for NFTs. Um, so that's the that's the idea here. As you can see, the stock has been an absolute monster. Uh, you see right there the SPAC. Um, no, I'm sorry. Um, I don't actually know when the merger went through, but regardless, you can tell exactly over the last couple of days when the NFT things hit the fan because look at those volume bars, right? Insanity. This thing was a dollar. Actually, to start the year, yeah, start the year was a dollar, and now it's five. Got as high as uh, seven sixty four. So, I want to ask Mike, or I want Chris to ask Mike um, about this, and if he has an opinion. I hope Chris asks him if if he has an opinion on on the reaction to the stock. There's obviously a lot of enthusiasm, but are we in the top of the first, or are we just in something that isn't even like a real thing, I guess. I know everyone's doing NFTs. If you all have a favorite N NFT NFT stock, I said that in quotes. If you have a favorite NFT stock, I'm, I'd be curious. Drop it in the chat. I don't own any of these things. Not that I'm against it. It's just so early. Um, Falcon Blood. If I'm wrong, uh, the, if the NFT is not what mooned it, what mooned it? 
please correct me. So yeah, the question is, solar open up. Are we in IC? Is this an is this ICOs 2.0? Or is this like Bitcoin 2.0? Right. I guess that's the question. Uh, and we'll get to Dolphin too, because Dolphin's uh, Dolphin's part of the thing. So we actually we had this exclusive here. Let me show you. This is Benzinga Pro, guys. We had this exclusive the other day. This is a news feed of Benzinga Pro. Let me zoom in. Okay, so you can make it read it. There we go. Look at that. We had that headline. We're the ones that broke that news. 4:48 p.m. on Tuesday. The partnership with Dolphin Entertainment to begin offering NFTs. So it was NFTs that moved it. It was a partnership with Dolphin, but it was NFTs. Um, but again, we don't really know too much about this partnership. Hopefully we can learn more when Mike comes on in a few minutes. Um, and yeah, cause I have questions that, that I don't, you know, I don't think anyone really knows the answers to, right? Um, so that'll be at 406. I'd be curious to see, uh, one in chat if you, if you're long HOFV and, uh, two, if you're not, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious. Who we're talking to here? Are we talking to people with, with, with diamond hands, paper hands, people who don't have hands? If you don't have hands, then how could you type? Um, mostly a lot of ones. A lot of ones. Damn. All right. All right. And just out of curiosity, all you people who are along the stock, do you have like a like a target or a stop loss? I know that's like so boomer of me to ask, but I, I, I am curious if anyone here has. I mean, if you've owned the stock for a couple of days, you're probably up a lot of money unless unless you bought it seven dollars, right? Not the worst idea to have a target in mind or a trailing stop right on the downside. Say if the stock ever falls forty percent, you get stopped out. Just saying, not the worst idea. Um, that's how I would do it. That's how I would. That's how I approach high flyers, right? If I'm in stock, and I am in a couple of these, like I, I'm in a couple of cannabis stocks that are that that are up huge, um, and I have a trailing stop where if they ever fall like forty percent, I'm out, right? So where are those diamond hands at, man? I don't have diamond hands. I actually I do. I do have diamond hands in the sense that I don't really look at my portfolio very often, so. I'm sure I'm down a lot in the last month, but I, I don't know. I couldn't tell you how bad. So in that sense, I, I have diamond hands, but but I, I, I like to automate that stuff, right? So I'll, I'll put in a trailing stop. So I don't really have to worry about it. If I get stopped out, I get stopped out. It happens, right? Uh, let's bring Chris Cacci on. Chris, is that cool with you? Let's bring him on. All right, Chris Cacci, co-host of SPACs Attacks, Benzinga Staff Writer. What's up, man? Hey, how are you? How's it going, Spencer? Uh, it's going. It's going. So we've got this interview coming up with Mike Crawford in about six minutes or so. Uh, what What are you most hopeful to learn? You know, there's been a lot of attention on HOFV, Hall of Fame Resorts, uh, you know, over the last couple of days, NFTs. I'm excited to hear what are the details of that deal? What does that partnership with Dolphin look like? And you know what kind of NFTs are we going to get out of this uh, this deal? Yeah, that's a question. What kind of NFTs? That's and full disclosure, I am like an NFT noob whale, right? I don't really know a lot about. It. Chris knows way more. There's a reason Chris is doing the interview, not me, because if it was me, I'd be like, uh, "What are you going to do?" You know what I mean? Like Chris actually has real questions. So yeah, you know, so I I've been following the NBA Top Shot story. I I own some NBA Top Shots. I did an interview with a couple people who run a podcast, and we we've seen NBA Top Shot just explode this year, right? The yeah. demand for those, you know, NBA player digital assets has really picked up. So there's a lot of talk here, you know, to be able to use NFL players. Um, and turn them into NFTs. You know, what's the opportunity for HOFV look like here? When you say turn them into NFTs, what is like? What exactly does that mean? Turn how? Like what? What would the what would the NFT be? Like a, a video, a highlight, uh, a, a 
a picture, an autograph? Like, what are we? Do you know what we're talking about here? You know, it, it depends on which way they go with this. the The NBA Top Shot route is video clips. Yeah. Um. So obviously, in the NBA, the most popular ones, you know, are dunks or three point shots or blocks. Right. So you're looking at you know a, a ten to fifteen second, sometimes less, video highlight. Um, you know, where you get that uh, blockchain, then you own the rights to that. Um, you have it stored. But in the case of NBA Top Shot, you know, some of them have, you know, 35,000 essentially of the same highlight. Some have less than that. Um, so it kind of depends which route they go here, you know, in terms of scarcity. And then, you know, we had Rob Gronkowski of the NFL. He did his own NFTs. And they weren't videos. They were just, you know, essentially a, a digital um, art or uh, photograph um, that highlighted his Super Bowl wins, um, you know, with the Patriots and the Buccaneers. And they were limited to 87 um, for the Super Bowl ones. And then he did a one of one, you know, which obviously yes. raised more money. So yes. it just kind of depends on which route we go in terms of, you know, art versus video, um, scarcity and, and all that. Yeah. And Dave, David D with a great point. And, and actually, Chris is aware of this, David D. I'll bring up your comment here. Don't forget that Mike already mentioned in previous interviews that they're planning to move towards sports betting in Ohio, which, of course, is where the Hall of Fame is. So we will ask about that, David D. Not to worry. Chris is, Chris is on the sports betting thing. Uh, and and so that that is on the list of things to talk about. Um, I, I can respect the NFT game because it's, it's ultimate proof that there's a market – like whatever something something has value if someone's willing to pay for it right that's like the ultimate thing absolutely that's, that's i mean market. it's essentially market. like like digital trading cards yeah. in the form you know of nba top shot and and look at what happened with trading cards this year right and even during the pandemic last year we saw record breaking valuations you know as collectors you know search for new things to you know uh store their money in you know as an investment yeah. um you know also had money from stimulus you know so we, we saw that, right? The demand for sports cards increased, you know, more in the last 12 months than, than I've ever seen. Um, you know, as someone who collected cards as a kid, it was, it was never at this level. So yeah. it's like, it sounds dumb, but Hey, if someone's willing to pay for it and asset has value, right? It's like the ultimate, exactly. the ultimate real market thing. So I, I, I have respect. Uh, I have respect for that. All right. Um, Chris, what do you say? We just bring Mike on right now. That's absolutely fine with me. All right. I uh, know that's why you're all here. You don't want to hear me talking. Quite frankly, I don't want to hear me talk either. All right. So let's bring on Mike Crawford, CEO of Hall of Fame Resort and Entertainment, ticker HOFV. Good afternoon, sir. Hey, guys. How are you? Good. How are you? Welcome back, uh, Mike. Good to see you again. Thanks for having me. I wasn't sure after the last time I'd be welcome, but... Uh... <laughs> You know, you've appeared on, on SPAC's Attack, you've been on Power Hour, and now you're getting your own little segment here. So uh, more than welcome back on the show. We've got a lot of viewers in here, you know, ready to hear more of what you have to say. So um, let's get started and dive right in. So the, the big news since anyone from Benzinga, you know, interviewed you last, obviously, is this, this partnership with Dolphin Entertainment on NFTs. Uh, can you walk us through what does this partnership look like and why Dolphin Entertainment as the partner here? Yeah, I had a feeling you'd want to talk about that. So, uh, yeah, look, we were we were incredibly fortunate uh, to have an opportunity to partner with Dolphin. They're a great company that does uh, things in the spaces that we're in. Uh, so media, uh, they represent some of the biggest names in Hollywood. They're certainly in the digital space. They know how to enter into those worlds. And I was introduced to their CEO a couple of years ago in Miami at the Super Bowl, Bill O'Dowd. And he and I had a chat back then about our, our two businesses and how we could develop a partnership that would be mutually beneficial, you know, with us having great content and access to brand partnerships and the way in which they represent, you know, award-winning singers and artists and, and, and uh, uh, you know, actors. And so, uh, you know, media is a big play for us. And of course, we want to be, uh, you know, a player in that space with the content that we have. Flash forward a year and a half later, and, you know, the NFT space starts to really heat up. And of course, as a sports and entertainment company, it's our responsibility. You know, we look forward to being in spaces where our fans are, are playing and, and staying and interacting and engaging. And so, uh, you know, Bill and I had a conversation. Uh, we talked about their capabilities in terms of 
you know, bringing great content to life. Uh, they certainly have access to the platforms that, that's, that these NFTs are being sold on or traded upon. Um, you know, the artisans that are doing all the work around this digital media and, and bringing, you know, exclusive content to life in ways that are really unique and different and, and ways in which fans are, are, you know, spending money on and, and finding very valuable. And so we had some discussions about a partnership and, and lo and behold, we, we both found it to be uh, very interesting and rewarding. We signed the deal this week. Uh, we have content that we are anxiously awaiting now to bring to life. We're, we're starting that work and working with the artisans and, and look forward to really, uh, you know, having some pieces out there that will excite our guests and our fans and, and be a new business for us. Perfect. Can you walk us through the, the partnership here, the, the financials? Um, what does the, the revenue split or the licensing or the partnership look like for uh, Hall of Fame and Dolphin? Well, when you think about uh, the way this works, obviously there's a platform that sells this content, right? And there's there's three platforms out there. There's others, you know, Christie's and Sotheby's and, and locations like that that you can buy high-end art. But that platform will always take a percentage of the sale. So the economics start with, you know, wherever you're selling, they're going to have a percentage of the action, if you will. Uh, the, the, the subject, you know, if, if we're telling or bringing to life uh, one of our Hall of Famers or a, a celebrity NFL alumni or, or someone that, you know, is profile in our company with the, the brands that we represent, they're going to have a percentage of this economic uh, equation as well. Of course, we have to broadcast and interview, or, uh, publicize and, and make available to the public the kind of art that we're going to be, uh, you know, putting out for sale. And then there's the artist and the artist that's going to be doing this great work. And so, you know, one of the things that Dolphin's bringing to the table for us is access to the artists that really can bring uh, these images or, or the, uh, the subject matter to life in really unique and different ways. And so there's a piece of the, uh, the financial as well. And so then when you think about the net, after all of those expenses, there is a rev share model that we have uh, with Dolphin in place that we think is very fair and, and equitable sides representing the content that we're bringing and the capabilities that they have to help bring it to life and, and bring it to a platform for sale. Perfect. So, you know, I, I saw in the press release the mention of, you know, some players from the Hall of Fame to start with. Is there any working relationship with the NFL to launch NFTs, or is this strictly um, through Hall of Fame ventures here in the Hall of Fame players? Yeah, we, we are, well, it's not just strictly through them, but of course, these are the greatest players to ever play in the NFL. And so their stories are stories that we're not only going to be anxious to tell through our media division, uh, which NFTs become a part of, by the way, but NFTs that represent who they are, NFTs, you know, we have access through our partnership with the NFL Alumni Association to all 25,000, 26,000 players, contributors, coaches to ever be a part of professional football in the NFL. And so we hope to bring, you know, NFTs that we have to life through those brand partnerships, but also through our own content. You know, we're going to be launching our original Fantasy Football League next week. Um, and I've spoken a little bit about that, just teasing the fact that I'm excited to have this new fantasy experience for our guests and our fans to enjoy. If you think about the way in which those, uh, those, those geographies, the brands, the, the names, the logos of those franchises uh, in that fantasy league are, are brought about, that there's an opportunity for a, uh, an NFT there. And you know we're going to have front offices that may have an NFL alum uh, or a, a, a Hall of Famer as a part of that. And so, you know, being able to create unique pieces of art around our own league and then other content, uh, you know, we announced that we'd like to start this with the partnership that we've formed with Elite Holdings. And Elite Holdings, if you remember, represent those 10 players that had the, you know, the, the longevity and the, the uh, ability to win a Heisman Trophy in college, have a great professional football career in the NFL, and go on to be inducted in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Ten guys, that's it. That's the only ten that have ever had those two uh, distinctions bestowed upon them. And, and the, the funny line that we like to say is more people have walked on the moon than have had those two things. So you can imagine bringing NFTs to life with the power of those kinds of individuals 
and that's our first target. But we'll we'll have a lot of. Uh, I like to say we have a robust pipeline of of uh, archives, uh, one of a kind pieces of memorabilia, uh, very collectible pieces that can be transformed into these NFTs. Remember, the Hall of Fame itself has 50 plus million pieces of video and audio and imagery and artifacts that people may never get to see. And so this new business allows us a way to bring those things to life. Awesome. You already knocked out some answers to some of my future questions there. So I want to circle back, um, you know, to, to some of those later on, but keeping with the, the NFT theme here, the, the Heisman to Hall platform. So those 10 players, that's what jumped out to me on this. Um, you know, so we have Charles Woodson, um, of course, Benzinga, a Michigan company, so go blue, joining the Hall of Fame this year. He also won a Heisman. Did that have a lot to do with the timing of this launch since he's going into the Hall of Fame this year and joining as the 10th player in that list? Well, it, it certainly allowed us to call the the, the potential docu-series or the, the video long form that we're going to make with these guys the perfect 10. Before that, it was the incredible nine. But no, really where this started was when Tim Brown was uh, being inducted into the Hall of Fame, a friend of his, and he likes, he'll tell this story much better than I. Uh, you know, as he was going on to the stage, says, do you realize you're only the ninth, ninth player to ever win a Heisman Trophy and to be inducted into the Hall of Fame? And he, like myself, said, come on, you have to be kidding. You have to be kidding. There have to be more uh, players that have had those two honors bestowed upon them. But Tim, uh, you know, no, I've known Tim a while. He called me on a Sunday afternoon and we started talking about this. And listen, with my, my background in Disney, one thing you know is when you have great content and you have access to what can be a franchise, you look for ways to monetize that and bring that to life. And so we've, we, we struck the partnership up and uh, focused predominantly on media, but also live things, you know, um, you know, coaches opportunities and, you know, speaking engagements and, and really, you know, the chance to bring this franchise. I like to refer to that as a franchise, uh, the platform. But then when the NFTs came about, you know, these were some of the greatest players to ever play the game, both in college and in pro. And, you know, some of us don't hit our stride until certain points in life. And these guys were able to sustain that level of success. So we wanted to focus. I, I really felt it was a great platform to start with in addition to our fantasy league and, and the archives and other things that we're going to bring, try to bring to life in the very near term. Awesome. So we talked a little bit before you joined uh, about NBA Top Shot. Um, and I'm sure some of our viewers are familiar with NBA Top Shot, obviously, you know, successful NFT venture this year. What's the plan here, you know, starting with the Heisman to Hall NFLs, um, how many of each will be offered and what's the distribution look like? You know, will it be pack drop similar to NBA Top Shot or is this just straight up, you know, auction or buying off of a site, um, you know, method going forward? First, it, it'll be our goal is to put it on uh, one of the mainstream sites. So I think there are three that are secure and safe and, and have the ability to either trade in this cryptocurrency, or uh, there is a site that allows for a normal transaction through credit card. And so that's how we'll want to bring this uh, to, to the guests and to the fans that, that have the appetite and want to uh, have access to these kinds of NFTs. Um, the, you know, the platform, I think Top Shot has developed its own type of platform and, you know, worked with a company to do that. Our goal is to bring subject matter experts in in each particular area, and that's why we were, we felt so strongly about Dolphin. You know, they're great at what they do. Um, you know, promoting these, making creating awareness, having access to creative talent. That that's what they're bringing to the table for us. And then you know, having these out on the platform uh, that we want to you know really be able to showcase these NFTs was important. So you know, our our steps in this are still being very measured. Um, I won't go into all of the detail right now, but suffice to say, we do have a plan to roll these out. And look, the great thing about NFTs, I, I love, and I'm, I'm a collector of art myself, um, but traditional art. And so, you know, I, I go back to, again, my Disney days. It used to be decades ago when they made an animated film, you had artisans drawing and painted cells, and it would take three, four, five years to do a animated film. Flash forward to today, this is all digitized and they can put out three or four of these films in a year. And I mean, really high quality. And so that's what this sort of represents to me. It represents a chance to get to market quickly with fantastic content that nobody else has access to except for us. 
in a way that, you know, leverages the partners that we have available to us. Awesome. So joining us again, for those of you, you know, late here, we keep picking up hundreds and hundreds of viewers here. We have Mike Crawford, CEO of Hall of Fame Resort. That's ticker HOFV. Make sure you smash the like button, share this video with your friends, exclusive interview here on Benzinga. You know, Mike, I've got to ask you, you said that you guys have been looking at NFTs for a while now. The, the question I have, you know, with the popularity of NFTs now in 2021, there, there's been some talk, you know, about a possible bubble or the longevity of the industry. What would you say to some of those naysayers that maybe have questioned, you know, NFTs being a bubble or not being relevant a couple of years from now? Well, look, we live in a digital world. Uh, how much of what you do today is consumed digitally or mobily? And I don't see that changing for a very long time. Uh, I remember the day where we took content into the Apple ecosystem and, and started putting Disney films and, and other things, you know, onto these handheld devices and people saying, I'm not sure people will adopt this. I'm not sure how long that will go on. But the world continues to evolve and technology becomes a significant part of what you have to consider when you have content and you have to uh, be able to adapt and, and transition your content onto multiple platforms. Is there a bubble? I can't speak to that. You know, wherever there's demand and wherever people find value in a product, they'll continue to buy it and the, the, the price will continue to reflect that demand. Uh, but I do believe that this has a very long shelf life. Um, and I think it, it, you know, will it ever go away? I don't believe so. I think it just will continue to evolve into new mediums and, in different forms as technology helps us uh, advance. And so, you know, I, I we wouldn't take our business into a place where we didn't think that there was longevity. We, we don't wanna chase fads. We wanna be in businesses where we can be respectful and place content where fans and guests want us to be. Awesome, so, you know, I talked about NFTs getting a lot of uh, play this year. There, there's also been, you know, a lot of trading activity around NFT stocks. So, you know, we saw with the press release the other day, HOFE shares, you know, jumped on that news. How much attention do you and the company, you know, pay uh, um, to volatility with, you know, the NFT related stocks and, you know, the, the price of the shares from a news drop like this? Well, again, you know, it's hard because it's all around you and people are sending you notes saying, hey, that's really great for you and the company. And it is good. But look, our, our focus is not about um, the stock price every day. Our focus is to figure out the best ways to leverage the partnerships, the content, the intellectual property that we have to create value and create value for uh, our shareholders, of course. And but to create experiences that are unique and different that are going to entertain fans virtually or in a physical location. And, you know, I, I couldn't, as I said earlier, I couldn't be more excited about this new fantasy league we're launching. You know, to me, it's an example of finding the white space in a very popular area, fantasy, fantasy sports, fantasy football in our case, and, and launching a brand new franchise based model where you don't have to be the GM and the president and do the draft and the trades. And, and it can be intimidating for fans. And so, for us, uh, you know, what we focus on is execution. And we're a young company. We've been around for all of, you know, eight, nine months now, publicly traded. And our job is to continue to take what we have, exclusive access to content, and to figure out ways to really uh, create experiences that our, our guests and our fans will really love and enjoy for, for a very long time. We're not an NFT company. We're a sports and entertainment company. And NFTs become part of the business that we're in. Awesome. So you mentioned going public, um, you know, via a SPAC. So, and you say you're not an NFT business, you know, what's the the revenue potential that you have kind of laid out for this? And is any of that priced into current projections from the company um, that are publicly out there? Uh, we have not priced it into, uh, you know, the, the economics that we've shared publicly. Um, I can't talk about the economics associated with NF NFTs at this time. Listen, I, I think there, there's a reality here, and that is we're developing new product and new content. You've seen some of the, the uh, economics associated with Patrick Mahomes and Rob Gronkowski and, and others. And what's amazing to me is the when you give people access to great content, 
the demand is just incredible. And so as there is demand, uh, the economics tend to go up. But we're, we're looking very hard at this business and wanting to take measured steps because we want to be uh, protective of our content and we want to you know, share that and tell those stories in ways that are representative of our brands and the quality that we represent. If we do that, the economics are going to be, uh, we think, positive for us and uh, we'll have a we'll have a lot to build upon. This is, a, as I said, a, a pipeline that we have that we can continue to grow for many years to come. What's the current timeline on launching these NFTs? Is there kind of a date, a month or a quarter in mind, or are we still a little ways out here? The great thing about NFTs, and I use that example of, you know, old animated films versus, you know, creating films now, the speed to market is much quicker. And so when you've identified artists that have really high capabilities and you've got the content, it can be done in a relatively short manner of time. You know, our goal is within a quarter to have things out there in the marketplace. Uh, I'd love to say sooner, but again, we want to we want to be careful here. We want to make sure the quality is representative of who we are and who Dolphin is. You know, our our partners. Uh, this is a new business for us, and and we don't want to rush it. We want to we want to do it right. We don't want to stumble out of the gate or fumble the ball or miss. You know, uh, have a false start in any of the football language you want to. Say we want to do it right and we want to have the right plays and continue to push the ball down the field. And this is another example of where we can leverage our content to do that. Perfect. I've got a couple more questions and then we've got some from the chat here. So uh, you mentioned the the Fantasy League. I know it was the Crown League before it was acquired by Hall of Fame Resorts. Plans to launch. Originally, it looked like they were going to use blockchain technology. What what? What's the play here? Is that Crown League uh, Hall of Fame Fantasy League? Is there a blockchain capability here and a crypto play there as well? Based on that as much right now, we want to make this very mainstream and, and easily accessible by uh, all fans. Um, it's, it's not a cryptocurrency entry um, or staking. Uh, we do have a deal with Stake Kings that we did uh, just a few short months ago that allows fans to engage and, and back a team or stake a team, if you will. Uh, I'll be able to talk more next week about what that means in the context of winnings, because everybody wants to be able to win something if they're in a league. But what we're excited about is this is, a, as I said, a franchise model. There's going to be 10 geographic locations. Those locations are going to be announced next week. They're going to have great names and great logos or brands. Uh, we'll open our merchandise store because fans love to buy merchandise for the teams that they cheer for. We'll open staking. So even not knowing who your team yet is, and we'll name the front offices about a month or two later. And then, of course, there will be our draft and, and trading and things of that nature. But we believe that giving people the ability to learn about the league, to understand how to engage with it, uh, you become, you know, part of a, a social environment that uh, really allows you to be part of fantasy without having to be as active in doing your own thing against somebody's in a league. This is a team-based fantasy sport, and you know, one of one of our guys uh, says this all the time: you can become the chief trash talker of your team because you're going to get to interact with your front office, give them input to the selection and draft day and give them input to trades. And, and you know, you're probably going to learn some things because we're going to have professional fantasy football players at, in the front office doing a lot of this work for us. This is a really, really unique, one-of-a-kind experience that we're excited to launch. And, you know, look, those teams are going to play each other virtually every week throughout that 10-week season. Our hope is that as teams play each other, fans like to put a bet down on that, you know, and, and just like they would in a real game. And so, uh, sports betting is not illegal or not legal in Ohio yet, but eventually we hope to have you know a sports betting partnership in place where that league could reside and and we could have other you know sports betting angles as well as a company. Perfect. Yeah, I want to I want to hit on sports betting next. Uh, the last question I had here, you you know, I have to ask. You've got these the uh, grand ambitions, right, of becoming kind of the Disney World of the NFL. Uh, multiple hotels, water parks, you know, I, I've seen the pictures, it, it looks amazing, but it also, it, you know, in return costs a lot of money. Uh, what's the current financial situation and are there plans to do share offerings or raise capital in the near or long term here? 
near-term offerings? And, and right now, our answer is not yet. Um, we've done the offering that we need to do. When we went public, it was a hard time. You know, let's face it, last July was not the best time to take the company public. But we did, and we were successful in doing that, and we've continued to execute our game plan since. We've raised over $100 million of new equity into the company. Uh, the cost of this next phase uh, is around $300 million. So we feel like we've got the equity in place that we need. Um, you know, the, the the lending process has been underway for quite some time now. And so that's sort of the last leg of the stool is to put the the, the construction loan in place. And and we have line of sight on that with with several lenders. And that's our that's our focus to get uh, the assets built. When I came, it was a slightly more ambitious plan. And one thing I know is it's digestible bites, creating place creating the next sense of play and building more and more to give guests a chance to want to come back over and over again. It's repeatability, it's length of stay, and that's the plan we have. So we have multiple phases that we're looking at doing. This phase, you know, over the next couple of years, it's already started. You know, we've, we've started building, we've cleared land, we're, we're, we've done all the things we need to do, design work, all of that is in place. And uh, we're looking in the next couple of months to start the rest of the facilities as well. Awesome. So thousands of people in here, they're all excited to hear about NFTs, but we also got tons of questions about sports betting. You know, I, I know you've hit on that a little bit in these comments here, but uh, let's hit on that again. And I know we asked it before when you were on our show. Uh, Ohio is not currently one of the states that has legalized sports betting. Um, they are in talks. How quickly do you think, um, you know, we could see Ohio legalized sports betting um you know is that an assumption and is it priced in to hall of fame's financial model uh so so again i'll start with the last part of it no it's not priced into our model simply because we could never predict the future and, and you know I, I always say our crystal ball is as good as anybody else's but what we what we've done is we've stayed close to what's going on at the state house in columbus we've we've certainly met with consultants and uh, lobbyists to try to understand directionally where things are headed. Um, I do know it's under review right now. Uh, I can't, you know, I can't speak any more to that than anyone else because I'm not close to that uh, or those proceedings. But what we've tried to do, just like anyone else would, would strategically think about what a sports betting relationship would look like for us if in the event it does become legal. And so, you know, a physical presence at our campus here without question. We have a lot of different virtual that we could connect our guests to a sports betting partners uh, platform. Our fantasy league that I just talked about should absolutely reside on a sports betting platform for my money. Uh, you know, I'd love to be able to bet on those virtual games, just like we saw over this past year, sponsorship opportunity. So we've, we have continued to uh, think about that and we've had conversations with potential sports betting partners. Um, and, you know, we're, we're actively looking at that space in the event that it does uh, become legal. And I feel like, you know, we're positioned as a sports and entertainment company with access to, uh, you know, great content and partnerships and the best players to ever play the game um, in a way that we could bring great value to a sports betting partner. So I'm hopeful, you know, hope is never a strategy, I always say, but I'm hopeful that it does become legal and that we do have a chance to uh, integrate that into our company because I really believe sports betting is a way in which fans enjoy and enhance their engagement to any sport, not just football. And as a sports and entertainment company, it's our responsibility to try and be in that space if we can. Awesome. So you said, you know, already talked to several partners. Is that looking like that will be the preferred method here is partnering with an existing sports betting company? We don't want to become the house, as I would say. There, there are too many great companies out there. You know, I don't list them because then people will speculate, am I talking about one or the other as our partner? But you know them all. There, there are a lot of uh, partners that we have talked to and will continue to talk to, and, and they have expertise in this space, and they have an ability to bring what we can have and share in terms of content, physical space, virtual environments, uh, they can they can bring those to life in ways that we couldn't on our own. There's no reason for us to try to recreate that wheel. 
Awesome. So, you know, we, we've kept you here for, you know, over a half hour, Mike. I, I think that's going to wrap up with questions from us. We got to all the ones from the chat as well about sports betting. Lots of exciting things happening here with Hall of Fame resorts. We've got NFTs, we've got sports betting coming, and, and we've got that great Hall of Fame class coming in 2021. You know, Peyton Manning, Charles Woodson, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, following that as well. So big thank you to you for joining us on the show once again in this exclusive interview. So thank you so much for your time. Again, Mike Crawford, CEO, Hall of Fame Resort. That's ticker H-O-F-V. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. My pleasure. Have a great night. You too. All right, guys. Guys, smash that like button. That was a Chris. Great job, man. Thank you. Oh, yeah, God. smash the like. And if you are not subscribed to Benzinga. First off, I don't know why you're not subscribed. Subscribe. Second, subscribe. We've had so many exclusive CEO interviews. We also had interviews, you know, Jason Rasnick just interviewed Kathy Wood, Kevin O'Leary, you know, talk about powerhouse interviews here, you know, all through the day. We've got content now running from, you know, 8 a.m. to what, five or six most days now. So uh -huh. you definitely want to subscribe and, you know, stick around on Benzinga's YouTube channel here. I, I want to know. I want to know from you, Chris, and from chat. I want to ask the same question. Uh, one in the chat, if you are more bullish after that interview. One or uh, two in the chat, if you are more bearish after that interview on HOFV in particular. Or I guess it, it, you know, if you want to extrapolate to NFTs as a whole, that 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 works too. But I want to know one if you're more bullish after that. Two if you're more bearish after that. Chris, what what sense did you get from that conversation? Yeah, you know, to to me, I've I've never been you know into HOFV because of NFTs. I've always looked at it as a play on the the NFL partnership, the the resort. Um, what they're building there, and then also the sports betting opportunity, which I love that he hit, you know, on the sports betting uh, answers there from the chat. Yeah. That, that to me is the play here. If if you're investing in shares of HOFV, the the NFTs here, this is a just a cherry on the top. You know, that revenue is not priced in at all. Think of all the great content that they can put out just from Hall of Fame players alone. Uh, you know, I, I'm more bullish after listening to this. I also like the fact that they're not planning on doing a, short, a share offering in the near term. Mm. That That's a positive to hear here. I think they have enough money to get through, you know, into the next couple phases of that venture. And again, this is a former, you know, exec from Disney. He's got experience building consumer products and a great brand. So, you know, I, I love Mike and what he's doing here. And I, I'm more bullish after this. I was like, I'm so glad you asked about the offering, right? Because that's like for everyone on Wall Street, that's like top of mind, right? And it's it, we nobody would blame them per se for raising money, but it would dilute shareholders, right? And and I, I'm so glad you asked that, and I'm glad he gave a firm answer. He gave a firm answer that we can hold him to. Yeah, in the exactly. Future. Right, which which was great to hear. Um, and in in their defense, you know, Chris asked a question about. Uh, you know, pricing in, uh, you know, revenue from NFTs into their models. These, com these companies and these public CEOs, you know, they're limited to what they're allowed to say. Like, if he were to come out and say, oh, yeah, we expect, um, you know, we actually expect it to generate X dollars from this, uh, and they don't file that beforehand, like with the SEC, then they're in trouble, right? Um, so, you know, it it's a question you have to ask, but you ask it knowing that you're probably not going to get an answer that you want um, for everyone in the chat. Uh, but it's still a question that, you, that we got to ask. And there's a lot of unknowns and he, he kind of admitted that, right. They don't really, they don't really know. I guess we won't know until they launch anything and people start or don't start buying their NFTs. Um, yeah. And that's the thing, you know, he talked about the timeline wanting to launch these within the next quarter, you know, st starting with the, the, the Heisman to Hall, um, you know, offerings to me, I think that's a great first launch. And then I think we're going to see another launch right around the time, you know, of the Hall of Fame induction, right? Why would they not launch NFTs of those players going into the Hall of Fame this year? You know, I, I just think there's so much content here that they can get out this year. Yep. And, and like Mike said, you know, digital is quicker. How much quicker can you make NFTs than you can, you know, traditional trading cards, you know, print them, get them into packs, ship them to the stores. You're, you're looking at multiple quarters to launch that yep. NFTs within a quarter, you know, so so here we are. And that's why the shares, you know, 
already have ran up. And I think they're going to go higher, you know, based on some of that. And he also talked, we've got another catalyst coming, right? That fantasy league. He he told us here, guys, that's an exclusive. You're going to more news on that in the next coming week. And, you know, that that's not a huge part of their business. But again, they're diversifying. They're not just going to be a resort. They're going to be, you know, media, entertainment, fantasy, sports betting, yeah. NFTs now. I, I think, you know, we've we've got some extra catalysts coming here. I, I don't know, you know, how big the fantasy sports thing will, will end up being um, as far as the bottom line is concerned. Uh, maybe they use it as like a legion thing. I'm not really sure. The one thing we got, we got a lot of comments in the chat about his his office slash bedroom. Stuff. <laughs> I don't know. If, <laughs> some people uh, were like, "This is horrible, embarrassed." Some people are like, "This guy's got an office in his bedroom." Bullish, baby. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What's also, up, Mitch? I see you joined in the chat. Up? What's up? Yeah, hey, I how about show you? I wanted to show you some of the, some love you're getting out there. A lot of people <laughs> showing us some loves out there on the tweets. You know, excellent CEO interview, seeing it all around, people putting us up, giving us some love. So definitely, guys, if you guys enjoyed the interview, smash the like button, give us some love, let everybody know where this interview took place. And if you really look back, we had them on, I think, two or three months ago, guys. So don't, don't miss out when we do these interviews on SPACs Attack. All right, Mitch, your turn. Are you more bullish? Or more bearish after watching and hearing this interview? Well, at first, you know, when I first heard about it, I was wondering, you know, did they just include NFTs to just make the stock spike? I mean, I'm sure a lot of people were thinking that. Yeah. But after hearing him talking, it sounds like it's something that he's really been thinking about and, and considering the options. Yeah, over a year, he said. Yeah, it, it didn't sound like it's something that just came up. Yeah. yeah. And, and that, that was Great really point. what I wanted Great to find point. out. You know, that that's what made me bullish, at least. Uh, and especially because the stock has pulled back now. It's not at the level where it reacted. And so this, to me, just gave me a little bit more confidence because when the reaction came, it was around like 630 on the first pop. I mean, it got all, all the way up there, I guess, 750. But that first pop was around the 630. So it, it's at a cheaper level than that. And you just got more confirmation that at least showed me that this isn't something new to him. Uh, that it's been something he's been working on. Yeah, Chad's pointing out that he he was obviously on his yacht, so take that for for what you want. Um, <laughs> hey, that's I, that's I, a bullish, right? That's that bullish, is bullish sign. Baby. I, I don't Tell know. What, come pick me up. I don't know what that is. I was confused. He said they're going to launch the NFTs by the end of the quarter. That's next week. So I, I, like, I feel like he met within a quarter, yeah, like yeah. a three month time period. Although, if they do launch them within the quarter, holy cow. That, yeah, I I also interpret <laughs> I, I interpreted that to mean within the next quarter, as in by the end of Q two. That's how I interpreted that that, that comment. So uh, Spencer, how about the point that that Mitch brought up? Okay. So you know he he talked about how he's been in talks to try to launch digital assets for over a year. Yeah, you know, do you see that as a positive and that this just isn't a you know a fad play here? That of all the things, that was probably the most surprising, right? Because it, it does feel like we've been hit with all these headlines at the same exact time as in like the last two weeks. Uh, so to hear him say that they this has been on their radar for for over a year uh, caught me by surprise. I did not see that coming. Uh, I'm sorry, Chris, what was your question again? <laughs> yeah, no, I think you answered it. It, it caught me by surprise too, because I think I think you're seeing a lot of companies, right, that that have media assets. They're going, hey, can we make a play for NFTs or digital assets here? Yeah. Where you have Mike here, who's been trying to do digital assets for over a year, and yeah. this just sped up the process, right? And then they were able to find a good partner in Dolphin Entertainment. You know, I like the the comments on Dolphin. Why did they choose them? So instead of launching them themselves, you know, they're going with an established player who's worked with some top artists. Yeah. I, I like that too. I also like same with sports betting, right? Why spend the money? Why launch it all yourself when you can partner with the sports betting company? You, you know, it's 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 about capital here, right? They have huge plans to do all this. You, you can't spend all the money everywhere. So you almost have to do some partnerships along the way. Yeah. And that might mean you split revenue, right? So with Dolphin, you know, and we got our answer on that, right? That's an exclusive. That wasn't in the press release. We're going to take out all the expenses, and then there's going to be, you know, a revenue share between Hall of Fame Resorts and Dolphin Entertainment. Yep. Um, but also, though, like, 
if I, I guess you know, if I could go back in time, I would have asked, well, if you've been thinking about this, kicking the tires around NFTs for a year, then why does it feel like only in the last week or two has like everything come out at once? And it's not just them. There's it's a lot of everybody. Of so if you've been kicking this around for a year, then why? I, 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 I don't know. I guess why does it feel like in the last two weeks has been like a deluge of like three weeks ago, nobody was talking about NFTs or at least NFT stocks per se. And only in the last month or so has that become a thing. That's what I would ask. But uh, yeah, and I, I don't know the answer to that. My Here's what I would say maybe is maybe they talked last year about doing digital assets for the Hall of Fame class. Yeah. The Hall of Fame class got delayed, right? Because of the pandemic. So yeah. then he said, hey, let's do a launch of some digital assets or NFTs for the 2021 and 2020 Hall yeah. of Fame induction ceremony. And they had plans for that. And maybe this just sped it up because, again, we're, we're starting with the, the Heisman winners to Hall. You know, and I, I was surprised by that, too, as, as a sports fan. There's only 10 players that have won the Heisman Trophy and are in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And 10, one of them's going in this year in Charles Woodson. So it really was only nine. And, and as he said, more people have walked on the moon than been a part of that group. I mean, that's that's a pretty elite class there in terms of uh, the sports market. I'm sorry, Well, man. you guys know I always try to bring something, right? I'm bringing in something here, guys. I do know that. Let's see. Uh, All right, guys. So in here, in their presentation, and, and you know, we, we already hear about the Hall of Fame, but what is going on with this artist here what? mentioned? This what? artist is mentioned plain and simple here that it's powered, you know, and, and on four four portraits here, the Hall of Famers. What if they just start bringing out portraits like this? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's one thing we don't really have great clarity on um, is what the NFTs will be, unless he discussed it. In I it. think we're, I think the artwork and picture side yeah. of things. I, I don't think we're looking at video clips here. Um, I think we're looking at you know the art side of things, the portrait side of things. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> yeah it's going to be interesting. You know, Mitch, are, are you in the Brady Bunch? Mitch, can you see this comment? What's up, Mike? What's up with this? Feels like you're in the Brady. <laughs> Because of that blue different. background, yeah. On the background, a different color. <laughs> uh, I could do it all, bro. What do we want? We want red. We yeah. want green. There's your Brady Bunch right there. Let's there get every go. color going. There we go. There we go. <laughs> or I could Mike, just be thanks. like a little flashy. Oh, or... now we're at a rave. Oh, no, no. I'm, I'm going to have a seizure. All right. All right. Just okay, one color. All we'll, right. we'll change Please. it up. Please. All right. Okay. So, no one can, so no one can be upset about what color. Uh, I saw the question in Shadow. We're going to have an article up about this. Yes. Uh, this stream, this interview was part of a longer uh, three-hour stream. We're going to cut this interview out and upload it as a separate interview right here, uh, same place, youtube.com slash Benzinga. It'll be cut out of what is what is a longer stream, uh, but there will also be an article up about this uh, at some point, if not today, then tomorrow morning, uh, recapping it. There's also real-time coverage in Benzinga Pro. If you're a Benzinga Pro subscriber, there was coverage of the interview. You don't have to listen. You can just read. Uh, the headlines are posted as uh, we were going there. Also, I want to mention, if you don't have Benzinga Pro, you can get a discount, big discount, by entering the YouTube the code YouTube47. That'll get you a 47% off the price of a monthly subscription pay, paid annually. That's pro.benzinga.com for uh, your subscription to Benzinga Pro, your real-time news and research platform. All right, it is 4.53. We've got uh, seven minutes before our next show, After Hours with Ryan Rose Bianchi, who's going to talk about charts setups stocks he's trading stocks he's not trading stocks he's buying stocks he's selling uh, he'll take questions from chat the whole time guys if you have any final thoughts about the conversation we just had well first off i want to tell everyone make sure you stick around for ryan i'm a big fan of his work i've been watching that show that we've been doing here on benzinga he, he knows what he's talking about so make sure everyone sticks around watches that show from five to six. Again, we're running 10 hours today, eight to six. Um, you know, as far as the interview goes, you know, guys, we tried to take what we could out of the chat, right? Yeah. We tried to ask the, oh the tough questions. We tried to ask, you know, what everyone wanted to hear, right? NFT sports betting. Yeah. And, you know, this is what it's about. Exclusive interview. You're getting the coverage right here. And, you know, shout out to Benzinga Pro and our news desk covering this in real time. Um, so you can get those headlines, you know, right there 
um, during the interview. But, you know, I, I thought it was just a great overall interview. Um, and I felt like we got a lot of the questions answered. And again, I felt like there was more positives than negatives from this interview. Yeah. And these are these are always challenging, right? Because you want to um, you want to ask real questions. You don't want to come on, have someone come on and just kiss their ass all the time, right? Because that doesn't help anyone. Even if that's what the Bulls want to hear, it helps nobody to just kiss kiss an executive's ass, right? Uh, and tell them how amazing they are and how amazing their company is and their stock and blah, 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 blah. You want to ask real questions and you want to be fair about it. And you want to ask questions that will hold up if in a month or a year, uh, HOFV is at 50 or it's at uh, 50 cents, Right, you want your questions to to hold up o- over that time, whatever the stock does. And Chris, I feel like you did that. It, it's 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 a tough line. I, I, I think people don't realize how hard that is uh, to to be respectful, but also challenging in a way, and ask questions that a people want to know. Right, we opened it up to chat. We got a thousand questions about us. Uh, ask about sports betting. Ask about sports betting. Right, so we asked that. Um, but you also want to get the questions. The like. The meaty questions, like, are you going to do an offering, right? Where, where are this, where is this in your models, right? The real questions that maybe, even if you don't get the best answers to, at least you asked it, and we did. Uh, so you, you did a great job walking that line. And Spencer, to it. answer to answer that question in the chat about will there be an article? Yes, there is an article. I just put it in the chat. Shout out to our editor Jason Shub now for oh, getting wow. that out Dear Lord, immediately no. after the interview. So that is out there on the Benzinga website. So again, if you missed the interview, if you didn't catch all of it, you can read the summary in the article or you can go back. We will clip out this interview and you can watch, you know, just that part of the the stream today. Um, But again, you know, great content. And like Spencer said, we're we're not all about softball questions, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and just, you know, playing into the bull's hands. We want to ask the real questions too. So hopefully everyone got some, some positives and some negatives and, you know, got their DD for, for me with HOFV, this, this isn't, you know, a, I know a lot of people are going to, you know, trade it, but to me, this is more of a long, a long-term investment based on their, their plans going forward. Yeah. Yep. All right. So one last thing I want to add here, guys, is uh, there is a one revenue driver l- a little bit later on in the in September here that you guys could keep an eye on. Maybe they come out with something with some artists here. You got uh, a concert from them um, that's going to be on September 12th on, on at their uh, stadium. So I think this is when you start really start seeing them create that revenue drive. Um, just to give some insights a little bit further out. For the good company. call, Mitch. Yeah, good call. You know, you're you're seeing sports stadiums do that all the time, right? Uh, utilize their facilities for music. Uh, festival, you know, could be huge there. And then, yeah, I mean, what if they can do some uh, NFTs, you know, for that music festival? We already saw a couple of companies saying they're going to launch NFTs of, you know, music festival flyers uh, of artists. So, you know, keep an eye out on that. Great point, Mitch. What's up, Aaron? We got producer Aaron in the house. How are we doing? I'm great, Chris. Hey, great job on that interview. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you, man. Just so uh, everyone in chat knows that we see you. Okay. I guess we have to get the Dolphin Entertainment CEO. Yeah, I was going to come on to say <laughs> that, that I see yeah. the comments. We're going to be, my, you know, Zoltan and I will get working on that immediately. And uh, hopefully here in the next, you know, next week we'll have Dolphin CEO on. Aaron, if he's not on the show tomorrow, you're fired. Oh, my God. All right. I got to get working then. And there's my boy. We got we got Ryan here. But I, hey I, I don't want to. I don't want to change the subject too hard from HOFV, but I was just wondering, have you guys heard about this ship that's stuck? Yeah. The sea, the sea yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Crazy, <laughs> right? This guy, AV, yo, left field. Just, what are you doing, man? just knock it out the park with the left field question. <laughs> Yeah, you know, what a crazy story. And I think we're going to see, you know, it, it's going to affect some oil and some consumer goods, you know, going forward. But yeah, I, I, I wait, how do you get a ship like that wait, stuck? Wait, wait, and breaking news from Aaron, from producer AB. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't want to be the I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. But there's a ship. <laughs> uh, it's still also stuck. though. It's, it's no guys, dinghy. If, it's if no you're small not ship. On, it's big. If you're not on Twitter and didn't see all the memes today and all the posts about this ship being stuck, you're you're missing out because right. uh, Twitter had a field day with this, and I saw some great um, you know memes, some gifts out there. So check it out. All right. Hey guys, do me a favor, guys. If you guys really did enjoy this interview, I know there's a lot of you out there that did. Hit up my man, Chris Ketchy, on Twitter. Let him know that you guys appreciate his questions. He's not, not throwing no softballs here, guys, so definitely let him know. 
And on that note, um, I think we're done, guys. I think we got Ryan Wesbiani lurking in the background. Ryan! Where's Ryan? Where's in Ryan? House. How many on. people can we fit on screen? We can we fit, fit five. Ball, man. What's, What's up, Ryan? Ryan? Now it's a party. What's going on, guys? <laughs> what Ryan, what did you, Ryan, did you hear about the ship, apparently? <laughs> There's a ship stuck somewhere? Yeah, apparently so. I just found out about this. That's what I heard. And breaking Aaron news. Breaking news. It was, it's all about NFTs and ships on Benzinga this week. There you I go. I think we got to pull up that picture. <laughs> hey, Someone who's pull gonna, it up. Wait, you just said it, Ryan. Who's going to make NFTs of this ship? You just called it. Oh, million oh, dollar idea. Holy There cow. we go. There we go. Dibs? Is that, is that, is that there you go. Let's make right? it. <laughs> Let's push this to the blockchain and make a few million oh, bucks. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Make sure you stay tuned on the stream for Ryan. Smash the like if you have not. Thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. Um, but you got Ryan now talking stocks, talking charts, and he's going to answer all your questions from the chat. So hit him up. Yeah, thank you. That was, <laughs> that was, hey, did you, Chris's interview with uh, uh, HOFV was awesome. I don't know if you caught any of it. I didn't get a chance, man. I've been running around. I finally got my dad a, a Pfizer vaccine, so I've been running around all week trying to get one of those. That, that, those things are like Comic-Con tickets these days. They're way too hard to find. Hey, well, congrats. At least you, you got one all lined up for them. Um, yeah, that was really stressful. I'm not going to lie to you, man. Especially in New York, it's been brutal, but thankfully... A shout out to Dwayne Reed. Uh, go to hell, Walgreens stock. <laughs> Ryan, I don't know what's quicker to find right now, the vaccine or the NFTs. <laughs> the NFTs for the vaccines are way quicker to find now. Um, well, we, we had a lot. We had kind of a crazy day in the market. Like a lot of stuff was up and down. Do you have your uh, – let's get that Benzinga Pro pulled up and we can start I hammering do. out I some tickers. I don't want to screen share and have like eight of us and then a stock chart in there. So oh, yeah. I think it's coming through now. Yep, let's go. Let's pull it up. Let's let's start. Let's take a look at. Oh yeah, you got spy pulled up. Let's take a look at. Um, yeah, just tell us what you kind of saw going look, on in the market today. At, look at this day, man. This is one of those. Days. I want to want to get it all the way into market. I want to start it off the day. So pre market, it was like we were all good until like, I mean, admittedly, I was asleep, but from four a.m. until like seven a.m., everything was looking chalky, low volume, of course. Pre market, what do you expect? But it was looking like, all right, we're going to have a good day. And then somewhere around like 707, 710, everything went straight to hell. And we went down all the way to 386. So then everyone's like, oh, no, pre-market, not good, futures down. Well, at this point, when the market's open, you got all the weeble and everything going. And you got the pre-market going. You don't really look at the uh, the futures anymore. It's like the futures are now. You could just see them directly. So you had a choppy. It was choppy, uh, essentially operating in this little box right here, going to a high of 386, around like 945 into open. And of course, we had the Biden press conference thing going on today. So everyone was chalky about that. But what was giving me hope was I was watching this all day. So I was watching Spy all day. Now, most of the stocks that I play with, I'm in the tech sector a lot as a long-term investor in a lot of tech. So it's mainly QQQ. But of course, my Apple and all that operates with SPY. So SPY is always important to me because it also affects the small cap stocks that I play with. So I was like, all right, here I, I was seeing we had like a bull trap and a bear trap all in one in one day. So here you saw the market like ramping up around 10 o'clock. So I saw people tweeting like, oh, it's green. Let's go out and buy. So I was like, I was like, mm, I've, I've seen this before. It went up way too fast, and of course, it came crashing down all the way to a low, I believe. If my eyes don't deceive me, that is a low of 384 and one cent. So 384. So people were freaking out. I saw people posting, it's time to buy puts. Let's go out there and buy some puts, trade some puts. I was like, ah, something's off here too. I didn't really – it was – It was. you saw – you got to keep your eye on that MACD. MACD is that fortune teller. I saw the MACD lines cross, and I was like, all right, we're going to be fine. So you start 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 to push up and kind of boom, come up and then come back down a little bit, boom, up and down. It was kind of like this oscillating momentum. And it was like the market was being held down. Everyone was scared of what Biden going to say. Everyone was like, we got to see what he's going to say about China, what he's going to say about immigration. And of course, we got to remember, this is all pre-scripted stuff that we've all heard before. I didn't hear anything new today. I think the only new thing was that he might run again in 2024, which like that's expected, right? Uh all right, cool. So then we saw that, and then like the press conference ended, and then bam, we ran all the way up into the market close, and now into after hours, we're up. So this is a good sign to me. It showed me that there's buying pressure 
here that people wanted to buy, but they were being held back by fear. And by people, I don't mean just retail investors, the hedge funds and everything. And this was a big event. People were worried what's going to happen. Is something going to go wrong? Is he going to say the wrong thing? China is going to get mad because believe it or not, they have a huge effect on our markets and our economy here because we do a lot of trade with them and politics and all that stuff. So when that didn't happen, you saw the big buys start to come in and then SPY went all the way to a high, intraday high of 390.55. And now we're kind of oscillating around that 390 point, which to me is a good sign. I'm hoping tomorrow we have a good day as well. I'm hoping that now that Powell and Janet Yellen are back to their uh, bat caves, they don't come out. Let's keep them at the bingo tables. Uh, no more press conferences for them. We can see that we can see the markets slowly start to recover. And you saw that in a lot of not just the bigger names, but you also saw it in the smaller names. So real quick, producer Aaron, I'm just going to look at QQQ and do a parallel analysis here to that. Let's and do you can it. See like, and you can see here, like a lot of it is still, it's very, 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 very similar. Into the open, you got your little bear trap here. I'm sorry, you got your little bull trap up here. Actually, no, this is, I'm, my time frames are off. So here we go. So into market open. You open up, really open up, and it goes up high. Came back down, not too much. Went back up, came back down here. To me, this was a, a bear trap again. If you looked at spy and held it parallel, spy bounced a little quicker back up, and then you saw QQQ bounce up, but QQQ came back down again. Tech is going to be struggling a little bit to get its sea legs again and get going. People are scared of tech. People are. It's the first thing that sells off in rotations. People are worried, but in my opinion. Tech is the future. Uh, Biden was talking about it today. One big thing that he touched on is, excuse me, uh, sorry, I'm getting a quick call. Let me just turn that off. Is that we saw the cycle rotations come in. Biden was talking about, hey, we need to invest in tech. We need to invest in biotechnology, AI, uh, quantum computing, security, stuff like that. So to me, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say one thing along those lines that I saw too is that, um, you know, Intel announced that they're going to get back and kind of making some of the chip processors that they had had quit making in the past and that's like i think we'll see some of that continue some more like a man, american manufacturing of some of these like technology stocks so it could be it could be some interesting um opportunity there a hundred percent this is this is the thing that uh american producers can get the leg up on right now is here in america um it's not like the past a lot of people were like we need to go to detroit open up the car factories get the car productions going up the beautiful thing is car productions with ev are coming back to america now you see um uh, lucid it opened up a facility in arizona tesla is now opening up one in texas everything is just slowly migrating back to america back to the natural thing and that's good for not just the country but for the economy and for the stocks because of course these companies will get tax per because they're EV companies. Um, one big thing is like you're saying, Intel on them, this is where we can kind of prosper. There's a huge shortage in microchips and chips and chipsets. Here, Intel can prosper. AMD, if they move back some of their operations here to the States, I'm not sure exactly where their operations are. They can do that move here. Battery suppliers are moving here. You've got companies like Microvast that are opening up facilities here in the States. There's so much going on in terms of brand new technology here in America, where it's kind of like this brand new or fourth industrial revolution that is happening towards clean energy and clean tech that the country can take advantage of from not just a stock market and economy standpoint, but from a job standpoint. You'll see a lot of these new jobs opening up. Yes, you'll have a lot of these jobs done by robots. But this newer generation, as these kids are going to college or even not going to college anymore, they can focus on trade-based work so that you can kind of take a look and see, okay, I can do this in the EV world. I can go become a mechanic here. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of hope for the country moving forward. That's why I'm, a lot, I'm very bullish on the market is I'm seeing all of this green, green energy being pushed. And I'm seeing all of it is happening here in the States. The biggest EV competitor to like Tesla or Lucid or all, any of these other companies is, for example, Neo, uh, Lee, Xping that are in China. So you're going to see it's no longer going to be a, a J Japanese or German uh, dominated auto manufacturing situation. It's going to be America and China. And that's where you're going to see our economy prosper is we're actually making the push there. And I think if the country and the government make the correct investments, which I believe they can and they have been, we'll see that the infrastructure bill will go over some stocks that relate to that. We're going to be in a really, really good shape for like the next 10 years. It's going to be a little bit difficult now, but if you look long term, these EV stocks and these EV companies, it's the future. You have to do it. It's no longer an option anymore. We just have to do it. Right. And, and I'm curious too, just kind of on your more like macro looks right now with 
as far as we've seen kind of some of this outflow from growth techs from QQQ into mm-hmm. some into some value stocks. Um, and is, like, is that trend something that we can expect to continue for a little bit? And if, you know, maybe like what can we look for as signs that that trend is reversing or going to continue either way? So you're going to see that for a little bit and you're going to see that from so it's it's on a macro scale like you said the, the movement happened uh you saw like for example this morning Kramer was beating up on these tech stocks and saying go buy Costco go buy Walmart go buy this go buy that and I get that but there's one thing that people ultimately and penultimately come to realize is that these these value stocks your Coca-Colas your Costcos your Walmarts they only have so much upside and all of these funds have metrics to hit they all have to try to beat the average market right now is Costco stock is Coca-Cola stock going to help you it'll help you balance your portfolio so I personally I have Costco stock I have Coca-Cola I have Boeing I have Delta I have these hedges built into my long portfolio because a I believe in them and b I got them when they were dirt cheap during the market crash but in the average, in the long term, the stocks that make you the most money, it's been proven time and time again, is it's these tech stocks because Facebook isn't slowing down, for example. Like last week in the stream, we spoke about Facebook. You had those amazing Facebook calls, which the day after were doing really, really well. Um, we know Facebook is making advancements in AI. I'm sorry, not AI, in VR, AR. They're definitely, I'm sure, working on some AI stuff in the background that they haven't discussed yet just to process all of this data. So the future is technology. Whether we like it or not, it's going there. Uh, COVID accelerated that. We saw that with companies like Zoom and Discord and um Slack, we saw those companies accelerate their growth. So it's not a matter of right now you see the growth has the growth on terms of the stock market and the movement of the stocks has slowed down, yes. But if you look at it as a long-term macro and as a long-term investor, these stocks aren't going anywhere. You just you can't stop them. You will hit pauses in the rotations where, of course, you'll have your companies that aren't as big and as well known and as sexy becoming the go-tos for these hedge funds like Costco, like Walmart, like Coca-Cola. But eventually you'll you'll see they're going to be like, oh, now these stocks are super cheap. We're going to be forced to rotate back into the tech stocks and ride them back up. So it's like, it's almost a systematic manipulation where, hey, we're going to drop these stocks now that they've gotten so expensive and we've milked them to the top. We saw Kathy Wood's fund sell out of Fang, which makes sense. There's only so much limited upside there. And then you saw her smartly come in and swoop in and buy Unity, buy palantir by um open door by all these tech companies that are the future um and you you're going to see like those kind of funds and those etfs are going to outperform in the macro in the five ten year landscape a lot stronger than something like the net that like for example the dow jones industrial or even spy or the mo- much more conservative funds they're not going to operate as well though there's a reason why those funds have an average of 20 to 30 percent versus the average market which is a six to seven to eight percent on really really good years so there's going to be a lot that goes in there and we'll have a we'll have a lot of fun watching it into the coming years but it's just a matter of we know that where the world is going and we can't stop tech and we it's just not possible, especially with these fortified companies like, for example, a Palantir, a Unity, a Facebook. So these are the things where days like this or weeks or even months like this when it's red, you want to start accumulating these into your long account and just don't look at them. Treat them like a bond. They just buy them, put them aside and come back to them in like three to four years and you'll be truly wowed at the potential. Just look at the past five years for all of these stocks that are out there. Of course, Palantir is brand new, but like, look at Facebook, look at Apple. The tech growth does not stop. And I don't see it ever stopping unless there's like a new Apple that comes out, a new Facebook, a new Palantir. And you'll see, that's where you'll see the rotations move there. It's going to be from tech companies to newer tech companies with more potential. This is why you saw a huge rise in SPACs in the past year, because companies can now that are in the newer space, especially in in the space sector and space exploration, that's a new sector. These companies don't have revenue yet. Some of them are nowhere near profitability, but they're spacking and coming into the open market. And you'll see like ETFs, like the ARK ETFs coming in and swooping in and buying these at NAV at $10 a share, because they know in the next coming years, when space exploration and all that grows and explodes, they'll be able to come back and be like, okay, I bought X stock for $10. Now it's $40. I've got 
a huge jump in my investment. So it's kind of like looking for where the world is moving, looking at the macro at to where we're headed. You're going to see a lot of changes in infrastructure and technology and healthcare. And you'll see all of those movements kind of coming. I'm super rambled right there. So I apologize if that was a lot. No, that was good. Good insight. I like, um, you know, I do think uh, I agree with you that like, unless we see something that's going to like, um, you know, a concrete reason for us to think that the growth in tech is going to stop. Um, then I, I expect that on like a macro level continue. I am a little bit worried that this trend of uh, from growth into value will kind of continue at, through the recovery because I think a lot of these um, more value stocks that people look at are just for the first time in a long time expected to make a lot more money this year than some of the growth tech stocks. So I think people, um, you know, obviously a lot of investors are looking very long down the road, but some traders are looking more short, short term. And so if in the short term, if over the next 12 months, a, a company like Boeing is expected to make more money than, um, you know, a, a more growth tech oriented stock like uh, PayPal or something like that, right. then it would, it would make sense why money would be flowing out of those growth, growth stocks into those value stocks for a little bit longer. But, right. um, you know, it all depends on kind of how long the horizon you're looking down the line. Right. The thing is, these stocks have all recovered already. That's what I don't understand is uh, you'll hear it on CNBC. You'll hear analysts talking about we're rotating into these recovery stocks. Well, these stocks have recovered. Let me pull up like Boeing, for example. Boeing was a stock that was like dirt cheap a few months back uh, when the crash was happening and into the crash. You saw Boeing crash back down. And now if we look at it, uh, let me pull it up on had a, a big day today because I think there is news about really them. Let me see. Yeah, they did 3% today. And of course, 3% to like the penny stock world is nothing. But to like a company like Boeing, that's a lot of money. Because yeah, if you have some open money. call options on Boeing and they go up 3%, you're, you're making a lot of money. <laughs> making a lot of money. Look, Boeing down here was where it was. It recovered quickly, but then came back down. Boeing came back up. And now it's slowly trying to flex its way back up to these higher highs of where it was in the 350s. Now, is the upside there to get back to the 350s in such a short time frame where you're saying let's abandon tech and go into like Boeing, going to Delta, going to Coca-Cola? I don't think so. I think the world is has also come to the realization that, hey, a company like Boeing is great, but there's so many new companies coming out in aviation that maybe Boeing isn't exactly the future. Maybe Boeing's planes aren't just as good enough as we thought we would be. Boeing to a lot of people seems like a monopoly. It's like one of the only companies that's out there that makes these airplanes that you'll hear about and you'll ride in. So we'll definitely have to see where it goes. I am a bull on Boeing, full transparency. I like Boeing a lot. I just feel like it's going to take them a lot longer to get back to 350 versus like a company like Palantir going from 20 back to 30. I think the upside there for a Palantir is a lot much faster than a company like Boeing. That's just my personal belief and personal way of going. And it says Boeing, trades are, Boeing shares are trading higher on reports that they may resume 787 jet deliveries this week, which would be great. And a big catalyst here would be if um, they're allowed to sell their planes back to China again. And that's going to give it an even bigger bump if that happens. But I don't see that in the imminent future. So if they're betting on that, I don't really know too much about what's going to go on. So I see a good question in the chat. Matt is asking, what would you call a catalyst that has stocks like Tesla and Neo drop in 10% or more in a day. Um, let's pull up one of those charts, Ryan. We can sure. look at Neo or, or Tesla. And I, I think Tesla. something here Tesla to consider is, is is sometimes with some of these growth stocks that have grown so much over the past year, two years or whatever, you can see drops like this that aren't really from catalysts at all, right. but might be more representative of the, the overall market flowing out of growth stocks. And it kind of shakes some investors. And a lot of times you have to keep in mind that some, some of these investors that are selling these stocks have made, you know, 50%, 100% profits. So 400, 500%. Look at where Tesla yeah. <laughs> was last year. Um, this is, so, that's a know, great the, question. And, and the back, and, and, and it's something that, um, you know, some of our buddies, Hugh and Dan say on the pennies and pennies going in raw podcast, it, like the back end of the trade always comes quicker. You know, over time, the stock will climb, 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 but that back end, the drop will always come quicker. Right. Um, right. And, you know, so it's, it's, that's something to be cognizant of if you're trading these growth stocks that that have those high 
uh, uptrends like Tesla, Neo, whatever, if you don't like seeing those kind of 10% drops in a day or you want to remove that possibility from your portfolio, then you have to be trading the Coca-Colas, the Walmarts, the ones that right. um, you know are more not as growth oriented and they will be a little bit more stable. Right. No, that's completely correct. And to to Matt's point, if um, the whole situation with like a Tesla, right? Tesla is a multivariable stock now. It's affected not by just the market. It's affected by Bitcoin now and even more with their tweet yesterday saying that they accept Bitcoin as a form of purchase and they will be keeping the Bitcoin on their balance sheets and not selling it. So essentially, they're the when you purchase a car they'll be investing the money that they have within their within so if you're buying via bitcoin they'll be investing that bitcoin because they see the long-term bullish trajectory for bitcoin a stock like tesla look if i see a stock like tesla that's gone from 90 dollars last march to 900 at its peak in january like late january we were in the 900 we touched 900 one of these days i don't remember exactly when it was i'm trying to pinpoint it down here there we go january 25th we touched 900 as a high a clean 900 when you're going from 90 to 900 you expect a pullback there's another thing that happened to tesla that is causing this pullback tesla was introduced to the s p 500 historically after 60 days or 180 days or six months of being introduced into the s p 500 i'm not sure exactly what that number is it's either 60 days or six months depending on the stock You'll see a run-up as it's introduced into the S&P 500 because index funds and the S&P all start including it. If you go look at your favorite funds now, almost all of them now include Tesla where they previously didn't. So what does that mean? They're doing massive purchases of Tesla. What you'll also see is eventually these funds will also see a run-up in this price. So if a fund like, for example, Kevin O'Leary's fund, if he has a rule where he can only keep 5% of Tesla and he bought Tesla down here into the run-up of the fund edition when the stock was, let's say, $400 and now it's $900, he naturally now is forced to sell in order to keep his rules and keep his trajectory. So you will see a sell-off in this stock. Now, does that mean that Tesla will never go back to 900. I highly doubt that. But it just means to you and me as the retail investor that, hey, I'm going to see some shakiness in my portfolio. Now, I'm not sure how old Matt is, but for example, if you're on the younger side, if you're like under 40, these kind of things shouldn't bother you. You're not, you're nowhere near close to retirement age. You're nowhere near affected by these things long term. And you're going to see wonkiness throughout the market. Now, if you're in your 60s and 70s and near retirement, these kind of stocks are really not recommended by any financial advisor. Not that neither of us are financial advisors, but I've spoken to a lot and they'll force you and kind of push your portfolio into those value or growth stocks or even put you into bonds where it's a lot more stable. So with these, you will see the risk and the movement and the volatility within these stocks. But you'll also longer term in the long picture, if we just kind of take a look at Tesla here, you'll see the beautiful projections as it goes up. And here it went up really, really quickly and it came down. And I think eventually long term, it should go back up again because we'll see more growth and improvement from Tesla with their self-driving, robo-taxis. Just go read the ARK Fund's uh, thesis that came out. I don't agree with those price projections. I think that they are very, very high, even in the bear case. I just feel like Tesla has a ways to go, especially now with the new competition coming in from EV. But on average, all these stocks, just give them some time and they will recover if you have conviction in them. I'm not talking about your random penny plays. I'm talking about your conv high conviction stocks where you can sit down and do EVs. We got a really good question coming in from Sung Kim. He says, outside of EV and EV charging stations in regards to climate change, do you think companies like BW will benefit from the $3 trillion infrastructure package? That's a really good question, Sung. So BW is actually one, uh, a green energy company. Uh, it's been on my radar now for a bit. So yes, yeah, so you will see this trickle down into the smaller penny stock world as well, especially much heavier. Um, you'll, you've seen it with these sector rotations. As we go into cannabis, you'll see those stocks pop. As we go into energy stocks, you'll see like BW will jump, CBAT will jump, DPW will jump. These are the stocks that you'll see go up. And that's why you'll see a lot of seeds and traders have these watch list and as the sector rotates or start to rotate into green energy via the infrastructure bill you'll see people jump into that stock into those sectors start buying up so now what am i doing the market was red for the past few days i've just been accumulating green energy stock shares why because i know with the infrastructure bill they will see a run-up now when is the bill going to get passed we don't know but we know that into the run-up of the bill getting passed boom you're going to see those stocks go up and you can scalp them make quick trades and you can keep your Coca-Cola shares where they're sitting right now. So there's a lot you can benefit from with this market. You just have to play it and time it 
uh, to your benefit. Should we start taking some questions from the chat in regards to stock tickers? Yeah, let's just start taking some tickers from the chat. Oh, I see. I, I saw. I see, dude, Forrest here. A shout out, dude, Forrest. I love that name. It dude says Forrest. What's going on? He said on something there? about. He's not even asking for that ticker, but he mentioned tattooed chef, and I know I've heard you talk hey. about this before, and I know you like it. So let's pull up the chart. Let's look at. I'm a tattooed chef. chef bull. They got beat up. They got beat up. Pretty Speaking bad. of, I know we spoke about this last week on the stream, but because you were talking about how, or kind of asking if I do any of my uh, grocery shopping like at Sam's Club, which is owned uh -huh. by Walmart, obviously, and they actually have a wide selection of tattooed chef um, products at Sam's Club, and I guess yep. that means at, they have a partnership with Walmart, so that's a, that's yep. a good sign to me. Tattooed chefs in Walmart, they're in Target, they're in Sam's Club. They're coming into smaller retailers now, especially in urban and more uh, like food desert areas. They're expanding into there. Uh, they're on track to expand their operations 2x into 2021. And then they want to 2x again in 2022 without having to build like bigger factories just within their facilities, optimizing it. So I'm a bull on Tattooed Chef even before they were Tattooed Chef back when they were FMCI as a SPAC. So if we just look at their chart, they are taking a beating and they are in a downward trajectory, but I'm hoping that they can keep this support level of 17, what is it, 1736, 1741 is the support level here. Um, there are a lot of gaps up that were sort of filled now. I don't expect this to come back down to 1776. This was during the red chaos that was happening. Maybe you come back down and see mid 18s. Um, it's just that with a company like Tattoo Chef, it's one of those that you got to treat in your long account. You can scalp trade this uh, not as often anymore. Just if you look at the chart, you can't really, I mean, you can catch it here and sell it up here if you really time the market correctly. But with Tattoo Chef, it's one of those that you have to just sit down, do the DD and do some, have some faith in. I put out a YouTube video on my uh, YouTube channel. Just search Ryan Rosbiani or just Ryan Tattoo Chef or Ryan TTCF and it will come up. I did a full analysis on the company and where I think it's going. I'm very bullish on these guys. That's just my personal perspective. And I think that these guys will do great. But again, do your own DD, do your own research, find the bear cases. This is something a lot of investors don't do is go and look for videos and analysis about people who talk about a stock that they don't like. You can learn a lot more from them than from someone who's validating your, your thesis. Uh, those bear cases will help you learn a lot about a stock and then you can start to do dd within the bear case and kind of take it apart so tattooed chef um uh, uh dude forest i like it i don't know if you're in it i don't know what exactly your question was uh would it be gold if they partnered with tattooed chef i'm not sure who he's talking about partnering with tattooed chef but i mean I think if Tattoo Chef's partnerships are it's a key to their business expanding is partnerships and expansions into um different stores uh dude forest is asking and a few other people are asking about f cell should we jump into f cell oh i was on mute i said let's do it oh, no worries <laughs> uh f cell is an interesting one this is one that's going to benefit from this green infrastructure bill f cell i will show you guys an overview so if you, this is the benzinga pro tool um, F cell is a, a fuel cell company. It designs and manufactures and installs and operates services of, for fuel cell products. So again, in that whole green energy expansion into batteries, into the next generation of energy away from gasoline and oil. Um, so if we look at the chart, this one, just like most other stocks is taking a beating. I'm very happy that this 200 MA was not touched. It would have gotten really ugly if we broke the 200 MA on a stock like this. And if you look down here, it's been fighting. It's been like a sort of, if I'm going to expand, I've never expanded the MACD this much in the video, but if you look, the MACD is really fighting to reverse here. It was in the downward trajectory, flipped, flipped again. It really wants to go up, but again, it's going to need that catalyst. One sign of hope is the volume is still relatively the same. Um, I think they had earnings recently, if I'm not mistaken. I want to see here. I think I swear they had. There we go. Uh, no, those were put. Uh, those were put. Some people are buying puts on it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, they had earnings. They missed. Um, they missed pretty hard. Uh, yeah, they missed really hard. Uh, so. That's the thing with these early on stage companies, as they're expanding and growing, you're going to see a lot of growing pains within them. You, it's got to be a longer term play or you play it into the catalyst and kind of use that catalyst to your advantage and kind of make money off of it. Uh, this does have some more move, more space to go lower. Again, it's very close to this support level here during the red chaos of 1107. Can it come down there? We'll have to see it tomorrow. 
but I think that the green energy bill might just save this stock. Again, if you like any stock, a rule of thumb is to always dollar cost average in. Don't buy your full position at any dip because you don't know if the dip is the actual true final dip. So if you buy here, you buy more here, you buy more here, you can start dollar cost averaging and long term, your average won't be in a place where it kind of hurts you. Um, people are asking about Palantir. We talk about Palantir in every single stream. I like Palantir. I think Palantir is great. Again, it's a long-term play. It's becoming sort of a meme. Uh, I think there's someone in here who always says, like, we always talk about Palantir. But, I mean, if people want to talk about it, we got to talk about it. We're here for the people. Um, it's in a downward trend again. Again, we're playing with MACDs that are super flat. So we're downward trend. We were fighting for a reversal. Reversal got rejected. Uh, we're back in a downward trend again. Um Volume is low compared to the usual volume where you'll see up here around these views. I know ARC is buying this one big time. They see a potential for it. These guys have government contracts. That's what gives me a lot of hope. We still don't have a 200 moving average because, of course, it hasn't even, it just recently started building a 50 moving average. But let me see if I can pull up the, uh, the four hour chart real quick and kind of use that. Um, the four hour chart tells me that it really wants to reverse. So if you look here on the four hour chart, it's kind of like a smaller preview into the daily chart. You can kind of start playing with intervals here. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm in candles and at Heikinashi. So you see, you have, you have big movement days here in balance here. And then, of course, earnings hurt it a lot, and it still hasn't recovered from that earnings drop. So you, you, this one's another one you got to be patient with. Like, it, this one IPO, they did a direct IPO at $10 a share. Now it's at 21. So it's d double where it was. If you got if you bought it here around this area, you're do, you're doing fine. You shouldn't even be thinking about it when you're up 100% on a stock. Don't even think about it. Take profits, or and look to add on lower days. Especially like if you look here, you bought here, you could sell some here on the way up, uh, accumulate more down here again on these flat. Just ride it out, sell up here, uh, buy when it's low, buy when it's low again. So you could dollar cost average. You can make money along the way, and you can still keep your long term position. Not a financial advisor though. So that there's our daily palantir. <laughs> discussion um lift that's one stock we've never talked about on any of these streams i gotta touch it i gotta touch lift l y f t lift if you folks don't know lift is like uber driving services they've been doing pretty well in the recent past few months these guys traded at 25 i believe they ipo'd a few years ago if not a year ago yeah they ipo'd last april at 87 dollars. wow these guys came down hard from their ipo uh yeah if you caught it here during the March dip at $14, $15. You're doing really well right now a year later. Uh, there's a gap here in the chart, but it's so far back. I don't think it'll be affected. Uh, it looks like Lyft, trade, Lyft shares are trading higher after Morgan Stanley maintained an equal weight on the stock, which means, hey, we're not going to change much about where it is. We think it's at a good range, but they boosted it from a 60 to 65 price target. See, you'll see a lot of price targets come out for stocks. People like Morgan Stanley, Chase, JP Morgan Chase. Those are the price targets that really matter and move the market. If someone on some random schmo analyst puts out a price target of $1,000 per share. Like I saw a stock today, a uh, penny stock that's literally a dollar with a price target of $120. That's not going to move the stock up. Uh, but a Morgan Stanley or a JP Morgan in them, they will move the stock upwards with their projections because their analysts are are a lot more respected and it's a company that is kind of, it's a higher caliber. So Lyft right now is really, really high. There's a lot of hype behind it today. So if you're in it, Noah, congratulations. You did really well. I, I don't know where you bought it, but I, you're doing really well. I do expect this to calm down and come down and touch the 50 MA in the near future, which is around the $56 range. Because when these stocks go up so fast, they will come down and calm down a little bit, especially as tech is hurting because Lyft essentially is a tech company. I do see it coming and cooling off a little bit. And then you can probably catch it on the way up. But again, what, one thing that's a little bit weird is the MACD is telling me we're going down, but the RSI is telling me we're going up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull it up in the 30 minute time frame so the 30 minute time frame gives me a better idea 30 minute time frame says we're going up so we could continue going up and touching that 65 dollar price target but eventually it could calm down and come back lower so keep your eye on it noah look for those red days that everyone hates to start accumulating your position maybe then and then play it out like it lift isn't going to stay up here forever you'll just have to see where it goes and then play it by ear um let's see what else do we got in the chart coming in hot Um, bum, 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 bum. I see you. I see Unity. Someone's asking for Unity. 
Let's go to Unity. Let's go to Unity. Unity is one of the newer ARC purchases. Uh, Unity, for those of you who don't know, it's a game design company. They also work in 3D technology, AR, VR a lot. They're really big. They're almost back down to where they IPO'd. So these folks IPO'd uh, last September around $75 into the open. Uh, today, they're sitting at about $90. Again, it's not too much of a big gap there where but it's down from its from its highs of like 180 this was a very expensive stock just a few months ago in december and now it's come back down it's kind of lulled uh it's sort of double bottomed here we'll have to see if tomorrow we break this but you've got your double bottom happening here uh you've got a gap down here so i'd love to see that gap filled i, I always love seeing a upward a gap down gets filled on the way up but we'll definitely have to see but it's not a good sign that it ripped through the 50 and the 21 ma it just means that it's super cheap this is in the tech sector so it's going to get affected really hard just like all the other tech sector stocks so you'll definitely have to kind of keep your eye on this one but to me again this is more of a longer term play just watch it don't catch a falling knife and see where it goes and kind of take it from there um Richard Judge is asking about Arrival. Uh, this is a brand new company. Well, it was a SPAC, but now they're finally had their name changed to Arrival. So these guys are operating in, oh, we don't have the data yet. Oh, let me see if the old SPAC pulls it up. Yes, there we go. Let me see if this is today, March 24. No, we don't have today's candle on here. All right. Um, Arrival, I, I like Arrival a lot. They've got a huge order from, let's see if I can manipulate this to give me something it's not giving me anything let the arrival has a huge order from fedex of a few million dollars in um a few million dollars in uh orders for their buses they're like ev trucks and ev buses so that's what kind of gives me a lot of hope there and the orders weren't canceled everyone was like oh no they can cancel their orders what if they cancel their orders it didn't happen um the stock is down so if we just look at it from yesterday's viewpoint which it really hasn't changed much from then until now, the stock is down and it's, it came down pretty hard from its highs of in the 30s. The stock went really high. It went to 37 uh, right off the initial news. It bopped and then it came back down. Then it popped again. Uh, Arrival, again, it's a longer term play. On their first earnings, they're going to struggle. They're going to hurt a lot because, again, brand new company. Not much is going on. But you'll see a lot of uh, talk about their order with FedEx. And I want to see them do more expansion. I like it. It's EV. It's EV is the future. It's a matter of you land the contracts with you got another company out there fiii which is merging with another company that also operates in the ev space for ev trucks and they've got like a contract with uh that other company dhl and they've got a contract with tesla so there's so many companies out there i just want to put the ticker here to show you folks forum merger three i forgot exactly what the name of the company that they're merging with is but they've got huge contracts as well and this one's like a you got a spec here that's under nav nav is ten dollars so again, this is this could be another opportunity if the market recovers and when the market recovers, not if because it always recovers. Um, you can see this one pop up. So again, this is another example of how you can kind of use EVs to your advantage. Um, Man, DHL, whatever happened to that company? I used to see DHL trucks everywhere, and now I never see them. I feel like they're international now. They focus a lot more on international than domestic. So like for example, if you order something from like I don't know Amazon Japan, Amazon Korea, something like that. Those are the guys that handle it, and they're very quick. Those things, like I order like uh, books for my sister. She reads like this manga about like some uh, volleyball thing. Uh, so I get her some manga from uh, Amazon Japan, and they get here like in a day. It's weird. I'm like, I don't even know how like mathematically that works out. But <laughs> they must they, be they just ready. They're 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 there right when you set the order. They're loading the plane up, and it's going straight <laughs> to the door. You can get one of those books in that goddamn plane. Yeah. They're 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 wild. I give them credit. That they've got a really smooth operation. Um, we got a question coming in about workhorse. Workhorse is an interesting one. Um, let's see, workhorse. Workhorse group. This one took a huge dive after. Um, so these guys were in talks to get the USPS contract for their EV vehicles. Oshkosh got it. So you saw a huge drop that day. The stock took a huge 47% dive. And now you've got um, House Democrats or in senators or it's a bunch of people who are like, hey, we want to take this contract away from Oshkosh. We want to give it to Workhorse essentially again because they want to go full EV. So you saw hope build back into the stock. But again, it's still down to those low, low levels. And it's very, very risky in my opinion still here. 
because all these people that bought if that effort fails this will tank again you will see another massive knife down with this stock the big thing holding this stock up and holding its support essentially it's arc it keeps buying the stock so the fact that arc keeps buying the stock it creates support within the stock because they don't really sell they really just buy and hold these they sell their older holdings so workhorse is an interesting one i say keep an eye on it it's more of a gamble now here and to me, the unfortunate thing is it looks like they have not gotten anywhere close to achieving recovery. This was their recovery here, and it looks like they're going back into a downward trend one more time. And their RSI levels are at 35, so they're almost at oversold. So I'd keep a close eye on it. It's a riskier one, but we'll definitely have to see. Pablo says, DHL delivered my package from France quicker than my local county orders. Yeah, those guys are really good. They're really, really good. Uh, how about Takung Art? I think... I don't know what that means. Um, is that? Oh no, that's the NFT company that took a huge nosedive. Uh, yeah, tickers uh, T Cat T K A T. T K A T. Okay. Um, I hate companies that move like this. These guys were a penny stock here, and then they said, "Hey, we're doing NFTs to the moon." And then it touched seventy-four dollars, and they came crashing down. Um, and now it's back to. $40, but it had a nice day. It had a 7% day. So we'll have to see. I mean, this NFT things, it's being um, it's being used by a lot of different companies to kind of boost their stock. Uh, whether they really do it or they don't, I don't know. These guys seem like someone who will do it. Do I believe that a stock or any company should be worth this much just because they do NFTs? That's a that's a question for time to tell. I'm I'm not crazy about it. I think that there's going to be so many NFT companies and so many NFT-based platforms out there that it will dilute the whole sector. It'll be just like when EVs came out and everything was like, boom, we're in the $40. Then EV trucks started coming out and everyone started just slowly kind of declining like we saw with Arrival stock or F3 stock. So you'll have to keep an eye. I would never buy it up here personally, especially if it's a penny stock. You're always at risk of a... A round a fund a raising round like an, uh, an offering so i'd be careful with this one here uh i'd like to see them execute their nft before yeah I mean, I'm, I'm staying i'm staying away from this one is uh combining kind of two things i try to stay away from what are the two things that you stay away from well not i don't stay away from chinese stocks in general but mm -hmm. chinese stocks i feel like are you know moving you know it's just hard to have like more transparency with transparency with them if they're you know claiming they're doing you know like some of these Chinese companies have come out and said, oh, they're getting NFTs are really made. They make like water bottles and you're like, wait, you're doing water bottles and NFTs now, you know, whatever. Exactly, so exactly. Anytime I see a company that um, is going like out of their wheelhouse to do something that's in like a hot market, it raises red flags for me. And uh, I guess those red yeah. flags are raised a little bit higher if that company is based out of China. Yeah, because this is what we saw last summer was every single company wanted to become a Bitcoin miner all of a sudden. You saw a huge yeah, transition. Yeah, exactly. Like and then SOS, all what for happened, example. What happened, all those, all those companies you know, got the boost from announcing their their crypto mining, Bitcoin mining, and then they came crashing down because that's not really the company's forte. Yeah, because you'll get to a point where it's like, okay, cool. Your hype is now worn off. It's time for you to deliver as an NFT or as a Bitcoin miner or something. And then you'll get to the point where like, okay, crap. Uh, we can't deliver. The earnings come out. The numbers are shown, and you can't deliver. Zombie main is talking about Canon. Uh, I got a rebuttal to that. One, Canon actually is a very, very good Bitcoin mining company. They get huge orders from a lot of American Bitcoin miners. Uh, Canon is a Chinese company. But the tech that they use, they sell it. It's proven tech. They've been around for a while. Canon did have a – Can is the stock CAN. did have a massive run-up here into the Bitcoin hype that was happening as we approach 60K. Um, I think that this is a company – their books are terrible. They're really, really bad, but it's a really good scalp stock. Long-term, I would not touch it though. But this is one of those companies that – uh, Bitcoin miners are now forced to go and buy from because Bitmain is sold out. Bitfury is only selling to their own subsidiaries mostly now. And Bitcoin mining tech is becoming so scarce. But I'd say if you can get it really, really cheap, it might be really good to be able to use it as a scalp as Bitcoin makes its like back up to 60K eventually. Hopefully, hopefully soon. <laughs> uh Dino Seamass is saying GameStop to 800. Let's talk about GameStop. What's that? I know 
GameStop? I don't know. I, I heard that it's like this old company. Uh, they sell fossils, and then like when you try to sell them their fossils back, they only give you two dollars for it, even though you paid sixty. I don't. I don't know how they operate, but I heard that, like they're they're the big thing amongst the the cool kids now. It's like they're having a huge resurgence. I'm just kidding. All jokes aside, uh, GameStop is a doozy. GameStop is a like you. I can't. It's so hard to do any form of real technical analysis on. It. I'm going to completely ignore these four candles, and I'm going to completely take it as if this is the stock right here, and just kind of try my best to observe it. So, they had pretty bad earnings. They had pretty bad earnings uh, across from a fundamental standpoint. Earnings were bad. We have to admit that the company is a low float. What does that mean? That means the company stock will move quickly with any volume, and we've seen that. We've seen the stock run up to $400 when you've got the full power of Reddit and Fintwit and the whole investing economy behind it. And it's a noble cause. I'm here for it. I love it. I love GameStop in general. I always loved going in there. That's where I got my Pokemon uh, Diamond and Pearl. I picked Pearl. I didn't pick Diamond. Wasn't a big fan of Diamond. I like that Pearl, uh, that Pokemon from Pearl better. Uh, Palkia. So GameStop is, has a uh, space in my heart as a 90s and 2000s kid. So I think that I want to see them succeed. I just feel like the only way these guys succeed is if they shut down almost all of their brick and mortar. They follow the same model that Bed Bath & Beyond is following now, reducing the number of stores so the stores don't compete against each other. That's the unfortunate thing that's happening now is where I went to college, for example, there was three game stops within walking distance. You have to close those down. You only need one there. You start expanding more into their online operations, create more incentives for people to purchase and pre-order online. Their shipping costs are still high. I tried to go make a purchase the other day just as a test by a controller. Still was charging me eight, nine bucks to ship. I can go to Amazon and get it for free, free shipping. So it's like you they have to make these changes. Ryan Cohen is very, very smart, really, really brilliant. And I believe that he can save this company into the future. I just feel like it's going to take a little bit of time. And I still do not understand why they have not raised money. This is a company that needs money. The balance sheet provided the fact that they need to raise money. Why don't they raise money? As they can afford the dilution. Their float is twenty-seven million. They can afford dilution here. Go for it. Save the company. And I know a lot of people are saying we're buying this to screw the suits, the shorts. I completely understand that, and I'm with you there. You, I got you. Have my support there. But if you really want to put your foot on the back of the suits' neck, you really need to go out there and and take a swing at at the banks and how you do that is by buying assets like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and moving your money from something, from institutional banking into these new banks like SoFi, like, I don't know, all these other new banks that are coming out. So I like the cause of GameStop a lot. I'm with you. It's just, I want you to please be safe and please be smart and look into how the company moves and just don't overpay to overpay because God forbid this cause ends one day and it all goes downhill. I do not want you to get hurt and discouraged as a trader because I put this out last night and said, I don't care if you Panic sell your whole position, panic sell your whole portfolio and go full cash. I don't care. I just want you to never lose your faith in trading and never lose your confidence as a trader because that's there's a beauty and an art form behind trading that stocks like this can destroy. But just please be smart about it. That's my only, only request of you as traders who are playing GameStop. And that was a rant, ladies and gentlemen. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, hey, you can't, I couldn't have said it better myself, you know, I, I think. You know, I love the love the notion behind the trade, you know, whatever. I just don't I'm not gonna advise anyone to get in at this price for them to get hurt. Um, I do see That's some good stuff. comments about uh HOFV. I mean, we did the interview with the CEO, but I someone brought up a good point for you to kind of sure. bring it up and give us an outside perspective sure. on it. Um, and you know, I, I wanna add before we get into this, you know, with the we were talking about kind of companies getting into the NFT, taking advantage of it. I don't mm -hmm. see this as that because I think for some companies. Um, with the emergence of NFTs, it's like a natural um, kind of next step. And so for this right. company, since they basically own and license the rights to Hall of Fame NFL players, um, for them to not get in that with some sort of thing like NBA Top Shot is doing it, it right. just seems like the, the logical next step, not that they're, right. um, you know, like taking advantage of a, of a market. I think the, this was one of the smartest moves Hall of Fame Resorts and Entertainment made, and I'm totally behind this one. And I personally would buy the stock if it when it cools down. I've been planning on buying this stock for a while. This is this used to be a SPAC and it took a huge hit early on into the COVID recession. And 
they are starting to recover just based off of the merit of the stock. But for me, NFTs here make sense. The only issue I see with NFTs right now is you're going to see a lot of lawsuits coming around NFTs from players. So players, if they're not getting a cut of these, even if you've licensed the rights, you're going to see a lot of people up in arms. Now, will it affect these stocks? I don't think so because these stocks will get paid and it'll eventually be between like the NFL or the uh, NHL or the baseball organization, which I just blanked on right now. But and uh, national base, what's 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 baseball again? MLB. MLB. There we go. Major League Baseball. I was thinking NBA, which is National Baseball Association, but it's MLB. So all of this company makes sense. I want to see Hall of Fame NFTs. They'll be really, really cool as memorabilia. Do I think that MLB and all these other NFTs will keep selling for $1,000, $2,000 each? I don't think so. I think it'll eventually become like sports cards. Uh, when they first came out, all of them were hot. Even the crappy commons were selling for like 5 6 $7 each. And then eventually they'll calm down. I do like the movement. It's survival of the fittest out here for all of these companies. Uh, you have to adapt to survive. Dolphin and Hall of Fame working together to adapt and survive is beautiful. And I commend them. And I'm totally respectful of what these guys are doing because I think these guys are going to do great. And if you're in Hall of Fame, I haven't seen the interview, but I'm planning on going and watching it. Uh, make sure to catch that interview. It was, I think, right before when we spoke, right? Yep. Yep. Chris was on at about... Uh... 4 p.m. at 4 15 eastern with them so right yeah so after now. we finish here you guys can scrub the feed forward and you can watch that um i plan on watching it myself later tonight but i think hall of fame did something that was beautiful it was like hey we're working in the space realm um right now we cannot have these open events yet and we will eventually get there so these guys are going to do double well so they're going to have their event-based stuff and they're going to have nfts so I think it was smart. I think the execution was brilliant. I just feel like I hope they use this opportunity to raise money because executing an NFT is expensive. Blockchain technology is expensive, even though it's open source. You still need the hardware to be able to do all this stuff. So I hope they raise some money and I hope we see an offering soon. Um, I know that hurts shareholders. I know shareholders hate it, but hey, look, your float's 58 million. The stock can handle it. Um, you got a billion and one news stories coming out. See, here we go. Just take a look at this here. Exactly what we're talking about. Uh, notes raised 100 million. The cost of the next phase plan is 300 million. So I expect an offering to come down the pike that will be about 300 million to be able to fund them for the next level. And I'd like them if they're smart, which I believe they are. Um, the stuff that I'm hearing about these, uh, the folks behind this team, they're brilliant. I would have done their fund yesterday. I would have done a straight fund yesterday around the seven dollar mark just dropped it it hurts investors and especially retail investors but in the long run trust me these companies need money it's better off that they do it now when they can recover on the way up so what i would have done is i would have popped an offering right there a, a, a direct offering not a direct offering i'm sorry a public offering before i'd made the announcement so into this run-up, into the announcement and this hype, the offering would have been closed within an hour. So like, for example, Argo Blockchain Technology, they did an offering and it closed within an hour and a half due to the Bitcoin rise up. So if you time your offerings cro uh, correctly, excuse me, you can kind of ride this wave up and the stock can kind of help you make your money back into the offering into a point where it doesn't even affect you as a shareholder. So I'm really excited for your Hall of Fame. I'm really bummed out I didn't buy them when they were a dollar, but... I think they have a really, really bright future. So it, I would definitely recommend you folks go and check out that interview. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it was, like I said, a very strong interview um, that he gave some good guidance or not guidance, but some good outlook on not only the company's, um, you know, plans with NFTs, but also sports gambling and some things along those lines. Um, I do believe the company is, in, it does have something with the resort in Las Vegas. So it's interesting mm -hmm. that it, it can kind of double up there as like a recovery play with people traveling to the resorts and also as, um, you know, this interesting like NFT and gambling play as well. Right. And I, I have to say this across the board, guys, smash that like button. I want to get this video to 600 it's, likes. It's free. It's free. The like button's free. Yeah. Guys, if you're going to ask a question, if you hit the like button, Aaron has this new technology where he can see if you've hit the like button and we'll have a higher chance of answering your question. So they'll signal to me in the private chat, like Mr. XYZ, like we just saw zombie main just smash the like button. So, and that came up into Aaron's uh, API. So if you guys do that, wink, wink, we'll be able to answer your questions. Uh, exactly. So Julian, I see your questions coming in. Julian, did you smash the like button? If you smash the like button, we'll come back and answer your question. So we need you guys to smash the like button. We've got the tools to now see who's smashing the like button. We got an interesting question coming in about a company that we don't really ever talk about or hear about much, uh, Nikola Motors. Um, Nikola is interesting. I don't 
think Nikola will survive. That's my true and honest opinion on this stock across the board. This has had shake, shaky, shaky movement. Um, it's moving in hydrogen, which is an even harder space than EV. I personally do not think Nikola will survive. They will need a lot of, they need like a Ryan Cohen to come in there and save Nikola or something like that. But with all due respect and all they might need a jesus us, christ to come in no, just they, they need they need a jesus and a moses to come in there part that hydrogen see get these folks going man it's 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 a very very dangerous company to own shares in and the, to their credit they're the fact that they're above ten dollars still floors me and still confuses me as to how this operates with all due respect to the shareholders maybe there's a lot of stuff that you folks know that i don't know uh, Igor, no, don't panic sell nickel. I mean, do whatever you want. I'm not a financial advisor. Do whatever you want. But personally, I don't see a bright future for Nikola, and it still amazes me. I don't even know how their stock price is high or even green. So, I mean, it's a credit to them, but personally, I cannot see them surviving when you have a company like GM coming in like a powerhouse. You've got a Lucid. You've got a Tesla. You've got so many different EV companies. You've got even Fisker who won't even be here for like two years, two, three years. It's a true, true sentiment to see what happens with these guys. So we'll have to definitely have to see what goes on. Definitely. Sorry. I don't know if you can hear that printer going off in my background. No, no, you're good. You're good. Um, I, I, I like the natural landscape of noises. <laughs> We keep, we keep Let's it see. We, here, got, we got we got time for a couple more tickers. We do have to kind of wrap up here in five minutes. Um, I need I need twenty more likes to get this video to six hundred. I know there, there's four hundred eighty six of you in here right now. I need you folks do me a solid. Smash that like button. Come on, show producer AB some love and smash that like button. Show us what we're up to. Let's go, Igor. Don't get scared. Look into the stock. I don't uh, always. If you bought the stock with some conviction, you did some DD on it. Uh, see if it makes sense but don't i wouldn't just buy the stock because it's cheap because dips are dips can keep on dipping um ali mohota is asking about my opinion on neo and xping we did a really really good analysis last week with um with uh spencer and them about this one so they all move parallel neo xping and lee all three of these chinese evs move in parallel if you just pull up all their charts they're literally like lee is the cheap one x ping is the middle one or neo is like the tesla of china so you've got all three of these right there so it's a matter of which one do you want they all literally move together they're all backed by the chinese government they can do really well long term personally i like neo more than x ping i think x ping is doing a lot with their tech x uh, but it's just that neo has that luxury brand and feel behind them and they're expanding a lot faster so i would just say hey look into it more see which one you like and go with that one um brian m is asking about jivo jivo is one of those that's going to get a lot of love from the infrastructure bill so once the infrastructure bill comes down the pike uh, by the way we crossed 600 likes we hit 611 likes so Let's thank go. you oh good so job team much. So shout out to all of you. Keep the likes coming. Let's see what we can do. Let's see what we can do. Let's keep the likes going. But I'm excited. I completely forgot what stock I was talking about. I'm so excited. Jivo. I'm really excited for Jivo. Biofuel is going to be doing really great. Um, uh, there's so much into the future of what Jivo is doing. There's a lot of great dd out there i have a 30 minute video on youtube if you guys want to go check it out just type in jivo and ryan and it should pop up it should be one of the first one that comes up so go and watch that i did a lot of analysis there i'm going to touch another stock that i haven't talked about before let's get a brand new one in here man xl oh my god oh my god xl is that the that's the one that they figured out all their orders were lies right it was like a huge yep there it is so xl fleet uh which no no i'm sorry that was ride i'm sorry that was ride um excel is hurting but i want to talk about ride ride is one that these guys lied about their orders so their stock just came crashing down and this is another nicola here this is why specs have a bad name is there's so much uh chaos behind some of these specs that they can hurt the whole spec sector so for example you've got a company like tattooed chef that was a spec and is now out there into the world doing great things but when a lord lordstown or ride does something shady it brings the whole sector down with it and it kind of hurts this the, the stocks but let me look at excel you asked about excel so let me look at excel again another one of those that peaked wow this stock was 35 dollars, and it's just been slowly crashed through the 200 ma which to me is a heartbreaking sign for a stock breaking that 200 is never good volume has, ex has slowly gotten less and less um i need to make this macd bigger 
we're still in a downward trajectory. This has got more room to go lower. I think we will see it break $10. XL is going to have a hard time. It's one of those stocks that during their very first earnings is going to take a hit as well. So look look into it there. This can come back to Pennyland if it doesn't recover quickly. Um, it's an interesting one, but keep your eye on it. I wish you nothing but the best with XL. I like what they're doing. Um, do, 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 do. We had a super chat come in. Should we answer that one before we close out? Yes, sir. Let's do it. Okay, so it's one that I have no clue about. I C B U. Is it for real? I mean, okay, this is an OTC. Uh, is it for real? What do you mean? Is it for real? Um, it's a holding company along with subsidiaries. The company manufactures, markets, and distributes equipment of hydroponic industry. Okay, so we're operating in fish tanks. So it looks like these guys are talking about doing NFTs. Come on, man. You got to be kidding me. Please no. Just, just no. It looks like they're trying to um, capitalize and say they want to enter the NFT world. I just want to read it and make sure new cryptocurrency launch in Arizona and non-fungible token NFT progress at the company. ICBU, IMID. Looks like they want to enter NFT, so they're going to use that craze to kind of get a huge bump in their stock, and then they're going to sell off or do an offering and hurt you. I personally, I wouldn't touch it. I mean, OTC world is dangerous as is. You, you don't have much data on the stock, as you can see here. I'd be careful with that one. So I think we got to close it out with that one, Aaron. We hit 6 o'clock. Yeah, and we also hit 600 likes, so you know, Ooh, that's the important part. 666. Let's get, the, let's get super unlucky in here. Oh, is that what it's at right now? Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, no, my Lanta. <laughs> all right, Ryan. Well, it's, it's great to be with you as always, and uh, we'll see you all Likewise, brother. All right, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Smash that like button on your way out.